Morning everyone. Good morning. Uh, let's take our respective seats. Uh, this meeting is now called to order and uh, we recognize the presence of uh, Senator Marcos. And I want to take advantage of the presence of Senator Marcos because he will be uh, uh, leaving us shortly for a uh, important meeting. Um, before we continue, um, let me direct the, co the committee secretary to acknowledge our resource persons. Good morning. Uh, may we acknowledge the presence of Under Secretary Diosdado M. San Antonio from the Department of Education. Good morning, sir. Dr. Jocelyn Andaya. Good morning, ma'am. Dr. Nelia Benito. Good morning, ma'am. Dr. John Arnold Siena. Good morning. And Maria Teresa Tan from the Bureau of Learning Resources. Uh, from PIDS, Dr. Rosario G. Manasan. Morning, ma'am. Dr. Aniceto Orbeta Jr. Morning, sir. From Philippine Normal University, Dr. Allen Espinosa. And Dr. Marilyn Balagtas. From the University of the Philippines, Dr. Teres Bustos. Good morning, ma'am. Dr. Ricardo Nolasco. And Dr. Marlene Ferrido, Deputy Director. UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies. Good morning, ma'am. From Ateneo de Manila, Miss Maria Jennifer Concepcion, Senior Math Faculty Member, Ateneo Senior High School. Mr. Ryan Bruce, Registrar. Miss Maria Teresa Lindsay. And Miss Amelia Di Coco, Program Officer, Ateneo Center for Educational Development. From Philippine Business for Education, Ms. La Basilote, good morning, ma'am, and Mr. Cedric Forbes. From Philippine Science High School, Dr. Lawrence Madriaga, Campus Director, Philippine Science High School. From Public School Teachers, Ms. Joselina Halili, Master Teacher 2, Malinta Elementary School, Ms. Edita Herrera, uh, Ms. Mary Grace De La Cruz, and Ms. Levi Vergara. And of course, from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, Mr. Andrea Scheller. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Comsec. Um, again, welcome. Uh, thank you for your participation and your presence uh, for today. Um, the centers are very concerned with the uh, results of the PISA. In fact, uh, uh, four centers filed uh, four resolutions all pertaining to the results of the PISA. And Senator, and these are Senator Binay, Senator Angara, of course, Senator Marcos, and yours truly. And Senator Grace Po also gave a privileged speech also concerning about the results of the PISA. Um, today, uh, we have one uh, very important focus, and this is to find solutions in order to improve the performance of our students and in turn, improve the outcome of our next PISA results. Um, I think all of us know the results already by now. Um, DepEd gave an extensive presentation in 2019, and uh, I've read a lot of articles, a lot of analysis uh, pertaining to the results of the PISA. But what is very important, and we have to bear this in mind, is next year we'll be taking the PISA again you know, in 2021. And without doing any significant reforms, especially that will be felt on the ground, uh, don't expect uh, amazing results next year. So today we will be focusing on the solution. And uh, we also want to hear from the different stakeholders, uh, other, su other suggestions and other uh, solutions that uh, the government can employ to improve the performance of our students. From the legislative side, uh, we want to hear those because our responsibility is to make sure that funding uh, is made available to, uh, to, do, to, to the solutions that will be proposed. And, and of course, if we need to enact more legislation or other legislation to improve the performance of our students, we, we, we will be doing so. So with that, again, let's focus on the solutions uh, and then how to implement the solutions. Of course, timetable of the solutions. We want tangibles uh, uh, from the hearing today. So with that, I uh, would like to also hear an opening statement from one of the uh, authors of the um, resolution calling for uh, 
uh, an inquiry on the PISA result. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to the DepEd representatives all here. Many of you are very familiar to us, and thank you once again for coming. Um, firstly, may I uh, just say that first we need to congratulate the, uh, the uh, DepEd for submitting themselves to the PISA last year. We finally got the results, uh, good or bad, at least sumali naman kayo. Pero uh, um, firstly, let me uh, evince my concern at what seemed to be a knee-jerk response. Napakabilis naman na biglang lumabas yung sulong edukalidad. Apakabilis naman, parang uh, knee-jerk ata yung response natin. Wala bang uh, data gathering, analysis, consultation, and focus groups sa mga teacher, parents, students. Dahil yung one to four natin, matagal na natin naririnig yan, yung mga teacher upskilling, curriculum, uh, learning environment, multi-stakeholder. Parang these are the age-old uh, solutions which didn't work in the past and are unlikely to work in the future. Um, secondly, um, in addition to the poor uh, scores, uh, let me just say that there are patent inequities in the education, even within our country. So kitang kita rin yung uh, inequity between NCR and the rest of the provinces, urban to rural, female to male, and so on and so forth. So tignan natin kung anong dapat natin gawin moving forward. Last year, during the budget, you asked for an additional 30 billion. We only gave 20 on account of the performance that didn't seem to be commensurate to the amount requested. So sana this year, uh, madadagdagan natin yan kung may plano kayong mabuo na maganda and uh, talagang tumutugon sa problema natin ngayon. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Marcos, for that uh, very blunt and direct uh, <laughs> analysis. And uh, you're correct, no? We've, uh, if you look at the four uh, proposed solutions under the uh, Sulong Edukalidad, uh, a lot of those are quite old and rehashed uh, solutions. But uh, I believe those are solutions that we need to, to uh, make sure that it's actionable with time frame and with uh, the corresponding budget. No, Ms. Fred. Yung sa teacher upskilling kasi, maraming theories sa uh, educational improvement, Mr. Chairman. Ang akin ko tinutukoy, yung uh, experiment ng Vietnam. Unlike the rest of ASEAN that determined to improve the quality of basic education in order to raise the level of the entire system, ang ginawa sa Vietnam para paspasan, eh, rumachada sila sa marami hang PhD. Ang tinutukan nila, talagang PhD ng PhD, uh, para dumami yung training the trainers talaga. Doon sila tumutok bago pa ayusin yung mga eskwelahan. Medyo radical yung approach nila and I'm not recommending it in any way. All I'm saying uh, is that we do need out of the box novel, creative, innovative solutions. Otherwise, we'll be stuck in the same place. I truly agree. Um uh, Senator Marcos, that we need to have out of the box and something that we can implement right away you know, because uh, time is against us uh, for the next uh, 2021 uh, PISA examination. So we need something that we can implement right away, uh, low hanging fruit, so to speak. Uh, that's the objective our, of our hearing uh, for this morning. Um, with that, uh, we also invited a representative from the OECD, and this is uh, Mr. Andreas. Uh, Schiller, Schiller, and um, Mr. Andreas, uh, good, good morning to uh, you. I understand that it's already 2.30 a.m. in France. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. So, uh, well, thank, thank you for participating in this very important uh, hearing. I'm here with Senator Marcos, who's also very concerned with the PISA results. And we invited OECD to shed light on the results. And also at the end, I, again, no, let me put emphasis, we want to hear solutions also, actionable solutions that we can uh, implement uh, uh, quickly. So we first go into the PISA results in the eyes of the OECD and later give us your recommendation. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andreas Leiter. I'm Director for Education and Skills, and I'm responsible for study at the OECD. Uh, I want to first congratulate the Philippines for taking the challenge of measuring education performance against the uh, uh, education system around the world. And the results are fairly much in line with the method of investment in the Philippines. If you correlate spending per student with 
about 20% of students uh, that achieve the baseline level of performance. In reading, it's a little bit less, it's 90%. In uh, science, it's a little bit more, it's 22%. So you have basically uh, one out of five students who you can consider possessing the baseline level of skills as measured by TISA. Uh, four out of five were not reaching uh, those kinds of standards. A uh, few points, I, I assume you are familiar with the, most of the PISA results, so let me just sort of highlight a few points that I think are very important. Uh, the first is that much of the variation, much of the variation that you observe in learning outcomes actually is not lie between these groups. It's not that in the Philippines some schools are high performing schools and some schools are low performing schools. In fact, most of the performance variation lies uh, within schools. So actually, in many students, many students in many schools, in many regions, falling through the cracks. Second point I want to highlight is that um, it's not that students are not good at any of the tasks. Students in the Philippines are actually quite good in reproducing subject matter content. And they have to memorize material and repeat it. Actually, students perform quite well at Philippines. It's a great strength of students. But when students are asked to creatively apply their knowledge, and sometimes in new situations, <coughs> did not do well. And this is a very large part of the PCR tasks that require students to creatively use and apply knowledge. Uh, we do that in the test because the world economy more and more requires people not just to repeat what we have learned, but creatively use and apply. So basically, that is a specific weakness in the Philippines which comes back to the instructional system. Uh, according to PISA, students uh, spend too much time learning material by heart and too little time to actually creatively use and apply knowledge, question knowledge, you know, test hypotheses, build hypotheses. I'll give you an example. In the field of science, where the Philippines does relatively better, uh, students have quite substantial knowledge in biology, chemistry, and physics, but they do not do well when they are asked to think like a scientist. For example, design an experiment or distinguish questions that are scientifically investigable from questions that are not investigable by scientific methods. So those are specific weaknesses that we see which come down to the way in which mathematics and science are being taught in the Philippines. So from full results, uh, modifying methods of instruction will be very, very important. The same is reflected the productivity statistics. Uh, you could argue that you know the students in the Philippines spend less time learning in school or out of school than students in other countries, but that's actually not true according to PISA. According to PISA, actually, the time invested in school and out of school in, in the Philippines is quite similar to the time that students in other countries invest, but the learning gains per hour of instruction in the Philippines are relatively low. Uh, social background plays a role. You can clearly see a relationship between uh, disadvantage and uh, disadvantage socioeconomically and learning outcomes, but that social gap is not larger than in other countries. In fact, we have about 8% of students in the Philippines who come from disadvantaged families who still do very, very well by national standards. So in fact, in the Philippines, there are many students from disadvantaged families doing relatively well. That share of resilient student, as we call them, is actually larger than it is in other countries, which means that poverty is a big kind of obstacle to learning, but it is, uh, there are many students who are able to overcome that kind of obstacle. Let me highlight also one thing that, uh, that sort of to change uh, PISA results. We find that most Philippine students do not believe in effort as a solution for learning outcomes. When we ask them, for example, do you believe that 
success in learning is about intelligence rather than hard work. There is a large share of students in the Philippines who have believed that success in education is about you know, the genes I've been born with or you know, the family background where I come from. A much smaller share of students believe that they can actually change those results. We call this a lack of a growth mindset. And actually, that's very important for success in life. You know, if you believe that you have the means and the ownership of success, you are much more likely to succeed. i give you an example. If you look to the other end of the spectrum, the top performing education systems in the world are in China. Virtually every Chinese student believes if I try hard in school, if I invest my time, and if I invest my effort, I will also be successful in the learning outcomes. And that is not the case in the Philippines. So this is something if you want to improve results, changing the mindset of students, giving students more a sense that actually investing time and effort will lead to improvement of results is something very important. And that again comes to the student-teacher relationship that is quite important. Um, I mentioned already social background, uh, clearly an issue, also the performance gap between urban and rural areas in the Philippines, quite significant, but not larger than across other countries. So I would not see the primary solutions in this. They lie more in the kind of instructional kind of uh, system. Uh, social segregation is visible, but not dominant. Uh, I would also say that uh, much of the social segregation that we see is not between public and private schools, as in some other countries, but actually is within the public school system in the Philippines. So I think that's something uh, quite important. Uh, the very last point that I want to highlight is a relatively poor disciplinary climate in the Philippines. That was a surprise uh, for me that the Philippines is the country with the largest share of students experiencing disruption in school, experiencing bullying, experiencing a client type of relatively poor teacher-student relationships. And again, that is a factor that relates to learning outcomes in quite significant ways. So improving the school climate, the learning climate, improving the teacher-student relationships is something that I would pay quite some attention to. Again, if you look to the top performing education systems in your neighborhood, it's China, it's Singapore, you can see that, that teachers will spend more time than teachers in the Philippines to work with students outside the classroom, to give students individual support, to really know their students. So that kind of student-teacher relationship is much stronger in those high performing systems than we find it in the, in the Philippines. So these are just a few pointers for possible improvement. That's just the way we see this. These are results uh, from the OECD. Once again, if you look at the investment the Philippines makes in education, uh, which is quite low, actually it's the lowest amount of the countries being compared, and the performance is sort of not so much out of line with this. Much of the performance variation lies within schools not between schools, not between social groups, not between genders. So and much of this comes down to the instructional system, students not being familiar with ways of thinking and the creative use of knowledge and uh, disciplinary climate. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. What the um changes would you recommend for the method of instruction so that we can focus on those? Yeah, and I think what is important is that teachers spend more time uh, to, uh, and effort to give students time for reflection, that students have to solve problems on their own and are guided by the teacher in solving those problems rather than just you know, being uh, given specific content that they have to memorize, which students in the Philippines do quite well. But I think uh, instructional methods that give more ownership to learning to students, uh, instructional methods that reward success of students, the fact that you know growth mindset is not very well pronounced. I think those are factors where I would think the Philippines uh, invest sort of 
giving teachers uh, more opportunity, more responsibility to foster uh, advanced learning strategies. Uh, for example, uh, helping students to control their learning, setting meaningful learning goals, monitoring their learning progress. Uh, uh, if students are just the recipients, passive recipients in an instructional environment, they will probably not develop the kind of knowledge, skills, attitudes and values that are quite important for success in life and for success at PISA. This clearly needs an overhaul of our methods of teaching. Um, how do we jump start this effort to change um, our instructional methods and train the teachers in a more collaborative, innovative, open-minded, problem-solving way? I think that's a very good question. You know, uh, you might find some of the answers in some of your neighboring countries. If you look to Vietnam, for example, or if you look to China, what you see there is that it's not just about sending teachers back to university, giving them formal education and training. A lot of the teacher learning actually in these countries happens in the school. Basically, they have established strong professional learning communities. A very powerful method for teacher learning, for example, is classroom observation. If you observe the class of a teacher who does particularly well, if you have a strong collaborative culture in the schools where teachers uh, analyze and study lessons together, where they videotape lessons and then, you know, use and, 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 and uh, dissect them to see where the strengths and weaknesses are. It's the professional collaboration in the school that, in our experience, is the best way to jumpstart the process. Because if you just rely on universities, you know, you send teachers to, to universities, it will take you a long time, you will only reach a few teachers, it's not enough to jumpstart the process. And in a way, I think Vietnam is actually a really interesting country because in less than you know five, six years, they have tra fundamentally transformed methods of teaching through building strong professional learning communities in schools, also you know, giving teachers recognition for good work. This is also very important that you can highlight you know, where you see teaching excellence and then give those teachers a bigger role in mentoring other teachers, in supporting other teachers, in developing model lessons. We also find that you know, better collaboration across schools can be important. One thing you can do as government is find incentives to attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging schools. That has been very well done in the province of Shanghai in China, where you know all career paths of teachers are open. I do believe it's the in-school methods of improvement, uh, strengthening a combination of professional autonomy and a collaborative culture. That's the most promising way to, to jumpstart that process. Thank you very much. That's a very valuable insight, and certainly one which we haven't tried before. Mr. Andres, I have a few questions. No? And uh, the PISA is meant to um, benchmark and also find good practices or best practices from other countries by, uh, by, by ranking the performance in order. Um, my, my question is, that the Philippines is a very centralized system when it comes to delivering education. No? Uh, if you look at, the, put this in context, we have 27 million students being uh, taught by central government. We have close to 800,000 teachers you know, employed by government. Does a centralized system have anything to do with the performance of students? It, it, this is in comparison to other systems, no? to other systems all over the world. Yeah, that question is uh, difficult to answer. You do have some centralized education systems that are very highly performing, like you know Japan, and uh, some centralized education systems that have uh, less good results. I think the question really is not so much you know, the central steering. I think that can be quite a useful framework and powerful framework. What is more lacking according to the PISA data in the Philippines is uh, sufficient local autonomy in the schools, basically, to give teachers you know, and schools more ownership over implementation. You know, it's a fair point that the government should set the curriculum, you know, tell, you know, be clear about what students should go and what they can do. 
but it's also important for schools at the very local level to interpret that and basically translate it into the context of their students and their, and their, and their, and their teachers. So I think the combination of you know a central steering uh, when it comes to a curriculum, when it comes to climate and so on, and at the same time local flexibility, encouraging you know uh, initiative in the school, recognizing very good performance when teachers are doing a particularly good job, finding ways to you know elevate them in the status of the teaching profession when schools do a good job. One of the things, for example, even in centralized systems like you know. Uh, China, what you can see is uh, that they are always pairing high and low of farming schools. If you are a high farming school, they're going to give you more resources, more possibilities, so that you can hire more expertise, but you deploy those teachers, those experts, in a local, to support a local farming school, so you can actually rely on a local autonomy and responsibility to improve the overall education system. So in a nutshell, I don't think it's so much an issue of centralization versus decentralization. It's more an issue of how you use the relative, you know, perspectives of the central government, the regional government, and uh, at the very local school level. And I, I would say actually at the central level, the Philippines is quite well developed, at least what we call PISA. But at the school level, the Philippines has grown to give schools more, you know, initiative. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Andreas. Any Would anyone from the Dep Ed uh, like to inquire as well, so that we can get free advice in the dead of night? Thank you. And we welcome, of course, Secretary Briones to the Senate once more. I would like to inquire again about the uh, time that you mentioned teachers in high-performing educational systems spend with their students outside of the classroom. How is this time best deployed? Yeah, that, that's a good question, actually. If, 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 if you look at the overall volume of time, it's quite, the Philippines is quite an average country, actually students at the age of 15 years spend an average time learning in school, but uh, uh, in, when it comes to out of school learning time, most of that is either tutoring or it's homework. What we do not see very well developed in the Philippines is school supported individual learning time. And that can be quite important. It's what to you know, foster responsibility and independence of student learning. It can be a good thing to give teachers more time to support students outside the classroom. I give you an example. If you're a teacher in Shanghai, you spend only about, you know, 11 to 16 hours teaching per week. You actually teach much less than a teacher in the Philippines. But you work actually more hours than a teacher in the Philippines. And the rest of the time teachers spend, you know, working with parents, they spend working with each other, they spend working with individual students to support students in, you know, preparing their homework, making them responsible learners. So what you can see is any high performing countries, uh, teachers spend less time in the classroom and more time supporting students, you know, outside the classroom or their families. Sort of in many high performing countries, the teacher is not only a teacher, they are also a social worker. They're also a psychologist, they're also a mentor, they're also a coach, a facilitator, a much uh, broader role of teachers, which is actually quite importantly related to learning. But what we see in the Philippines is that the teacher's role, a role is mainly confined to the classroom, at least what I can see from the visa data. Of course, you know your country much better than I can see it through this data. Yes, that's correct. I think uh, we burden our teachers with all sorts of other tasks involved with the national government, from ele election surveys, from preparing fiestas, from all sorts of things that have nothing to do with students or the educational system. Um, would you recommend, for example, the traditional extracurricular activities like debating clubs, science clubs, and so on? Or are you saying that we should provide the students with their individual projects? that they choose, obviously. Yeah, I think both can be important. I think uh, extracurricular activities, uh, if they are well organized and academically related, uh, you know, a lot of extracurricular work actually is not 
so much academically oriented, and I'm not sort of convinced that would help the Philippines. I, I think having extracurricular activities, like for example, giving students opportunities to uh, uh, do their own projects, support them, um, having you know work in the laboratory, uh, connecting the world of work and the world of learning, giving young people experiences in the world of work. I think those kinds of things. Uh, uh, extracurricular activities can be very meaningful. It can also be that students uh, have more time to, uh, you know, do their own pro projects in the school. Project-based learning that is supported and facilitated by teachers can be a good means. There are various ways that uh, the Philippines could deploy to, and, and so teachers could have a role beyond the classroom that is academically oriented. Sometimes extracurricular activities is, you know, things like sports or social activities. They can also be important, but they will not help to improve the academic performance in the Philippines. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, have a specific uh, problem that uh, perhaps uh, uh, reflects China, Mexico, and other out-migration countries. Many of the children in our educational system have parents overseas, so there's an absentee mother. It's resulted in uh, dropout rates. It's also resulted in uh, diminishing academic scores. So uh, the teacher is required to perform a role that really isn't hers, um, to be the mother in that family, or maybe both parents in that family. What can we do to uh, uh, lift that burden a little bit? Yeah, you know, I think um, that, that, that question gets asked almost in every country, you know, where does the role of the teacher end and where does the role of the family begin? I think what we see quite clearly across countries is that schools in general have to take more social, um, more social responsibilities. In many countries you can see teachers actually becoming very actively engaged with parents. Uh, and there are two ways to achieve this. I mean, one is to assume directly responsibilities from families. That is actually, like in the Philippines, happening more and more countries. Uh, many parents, you know, work. They don't have the time or they don't spend the time uh, to support their children. So schools, for example, open in the afternoon where students can work in the school and supported by teachers. That is quite common. Uh, kind of, if you're a teacher in Japan, you would spend almost eight hours per week on those kinds of activities. Uh, sort of this is social support directly, but the other thing is to uh, strengthen the relationship and the involvement of families in the school activities. I give you an example. When I was once in a, one of the most disadvantaged regions in China, in Yunnan province, and I asked the teacher how she would, you know, engage parents in the school because that was quite visible in the school. And she said to me, well, you know, I call every parent about twice per week. And then when I asked her, well, you know, that must be a big workload for you. I mean, how, how can you manage to call, you know, there are 50 students in the classroom, call every parent twice per week. And she said to me, well, you know, I never thought about it like this, but if I wouldn't have, have all of these parents helping me, I couldn't do my job. So basically, the teachers invest a lot in building that relationship with parents. If you go to the Northern Europe, in Sweden or Finland, for example, Estonia, uh, teachers uh, work a lot with parents and students to analyze student learning outcomes to help parents support their students. Many parents often do not have the kind of experience and the academic background to effectively support their students. But the last point I want to mention, it's sometimes not just about, you know, academic work. Uh, we find in PISA, for example, the fact where parents ask their children, how was school on a regular basis? You know, this is not about having a degree and spending hours of time on homework. It's simply showing to your child that what you do in school is important to me. That simple question had a stronger link with educational outcomes than actually the, um, uh, the, the social background, the family income. And you can see the same in the Philippines where you have parents who are interested in their children's learning, results are much better, and uh, the impact of parents' interest in children's learning is much stronger than the impact of family income on learning outcomes, like in other countries. So one thing schools can do is directly take on social responsibilities, and I think that is more and more the case. But the other thing schools can do is to say,
simply find ways to engage parents in the school life, not when there are problems. You know, not just call the parent when there's something wrong, because then the parent will always take a defensive stance, but to engage them on a regular basis. Again, you know, when you go to China, for example, the parents will receive about three, four pictures of their children in school through the social media. So there's a constant effort on the school to make sure that parents are part of this journey of their children. Mr. Andres, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the growth mindset in the Philippines is only half of what uh, uh, the OC OECD uh, presents. Uh, and this has a uh, tremendous impact on the performance. How, this is a mindset. No? So how do you change? Uh, can you give, cite us some examples on how do you change this type of mindset? Because the mindset is also partly cultural. You know, in, in, uh, so have you seen any uh, high-performing countries that have changed over time this mindset? Yeah, I think you raise a very important point. You know, uh, first of all, again, if students don't have a growth mindset, they're unlikely to invest effort. If you believe success in mathematics is about your genes, then why would you study hard? You cannot change those outcomes, no? So I think it's very, very important to invest in this. And yes, we have very good evidence that you can actually change that mindset for students at the individual level and at the aggregate level. We actually do not find much evidence that this is a cultural phenomenon because even in the same kind of cultural context, you have countries uh, with a strong growth mindset and countries with a weak growth mindset. Uh, to give you some example of what you can do in a school context uh, to give uh, students as a teacher the sense that if they invest effort, there will be improvements in their performance. So finding a good ways of tracking individual student learning outcomes and to see, help students see not only you, know, you are not ranked very well in the class, but here is the progress that you have achieved by investing effort. It requires a very strong you know, individual relationship with, with the teacher. We survey that in PISA, we ask students, for example, do you think that your teacher knows what you can do? That's where the growth mindset starts. Does your teacher support you when you need help, that you feel actually, you know, you get the kind of uh, teacher level support? So, yes, I think we have very strong evidence that this is not fixed, but that you can actually change that mindset through the aspirations that you have. The approach of mastery learning, that is very dominant in actually many of your Asian na neighbors. It's a very powerful way of, uh, of basically changing this attitude. Basically, mastery learning means that you set the same ambitions for all students, the same expectations. You can never lower the expectation if a student comes from disadvantage or you know, from rural areas, and you will keep the expectations the same for all students, but you recover your effort when the student needs more help. So basically, you, you add more time for the students, you give more extra support. Uh, that's what those education systems do. They invest more, but they, they will never level down the standards. The moment where you lower your expectations for a student, you send the students a signal that they're not good enough, and there's nothing they can do about it. So attracting students, and screening students, and stratifying students, those are devices that actually work against the growth line. The policies in favor of the growth mindset are ones uh, you have universal high expectations and tailorized individual support. More, more time, you know, more attention, more so that every student knows there's no tolerance for failure in this system. Again, tolerance for failure works against growth mindset, and there is a lot of individual support when students really need it. Uh, yes. Uh, the secretary also has a question or some comments, uh, Mr. Andres. Uh, uh, I would like, your honors, thank you very much. Uh, hello, Andreas. Um, I don't think, um, I'm right now we have had uh, dialogues, conversations uh, with Andreas on two occasions uh, in the uh, Global Teachers Award Conference in Dubai. and. Only recently, and in London, my undersecretary also presented a critique of, of the PISA examination, and I have we have been uh, uh, having uh, dialogues on. Sorry, on the sound is very low. I cannot hear you at the moment. 
I'm saying that uh, we had raised some concerns about PISA uh, when we met in a panel discussion in Dubai uh, on the Global Teachers um, Award uh, uh, events. And also recently, just this month, my Undersecretary uh, of Education uh, was in London and was also a reactor to the presentation of, of PISA and we have expressed also our observations. What I'm interested more is in um, reacting to the uh, question of uh, uh, Honorable Senator Aimee about the role of the parents. Uh, from the time that the results of PISA in the Philippines have come out, we have resolved to visit the high-performing schools uh, in the different regions because we can learn from them. Uh, for example, we have uh, two uh, schools, public high schools, whose scores have exceeded or those even of the OEC average. Mm -hmm. so because we're talking here of a mean average for the entire country, but we also have high performing schools. Now, uh, Senator Aimee was asking about the role of the parents. Only last weekend, I was in Baguio. I visited uh, the Baguio City National High School, which has a very high sco uh, score also in reading. And um, we talked to the teachers and the students, and your observations confirm uh, what we thought, because when they shared their strategies, in um, encouraging or improving the capacity of the children because one wonders why Baguio, for example, and uh, aside from the weather, of course. And uh, the, the secret appears to be in the involvement of the parents. And, and this confirms uh, the observation of Senator Marcos as to the role of the parents. Uh, in Baguio City, um, Parents are, are very involved and, and really are drawn into the educational activities uh, of the children. Um, then you also have uh, Pasig City Science High School, uh, uh, which score is uh, also higher than the OECD average. So the, the, the picture in the Philippines appears to be a reflection of what not only the educational system is, but uh, the social, the economic, and the political framework within which the educational process takes place. We talk about inequality, uh, we talk about financial support, we talk about uh, um, cultural or attitudinal issues which children, learners, observe uh, in the adults themselves. Um, so uh, we are learning from this. And, and we have expressed very clearly, if you will recall, we had a conversation during the panel discussion and after the panel discussion in Dubai, wherein I, I uh, articulated uh, our, our position at the time that we were very hesitant to participate in the PISA uh, exercise because one, we felt that ranking may not necessarily uh, uh, does not necessarily uh, mean that countries are exactly alike and are comparable, one country, uh, because thi this is a very common uh, activity internationally. And also, we also said that we know and we fear that results will always be politicized. Whatever the results are, the results will be politicized. I said this in Dubai, and we repeated this in London, also in January. And, and then you, you encouraged us. We have been talking also with other countries, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, and we have ex, uh, uh, exchanged uh, experiences. And we decided to participate in PISA because we thought, we believe, and we still believe that we can get a lot of information, data and insights from outside of the Philippines.
because we know that we have an entire range of poor performing schools, poor performing students, but also very high performing students. And as I was saying, the two schools which exceed the OECD average are public high schools. And uh, for example, regional science high school for region six is in the Visayas. Region seven is also high performing. We have to learn why, for example, region seven is performing uh, better than perhaps other regions. At the island region also, at the island level, you have Negros Occidental and Negros Oriental doing very well also in their scores. So we are uh, uh, using the information and the data that we get from the PISA results um, as a basis for further strengthening. And it will be recalled, and we really appreciate the support of the Senate, Congress, and the executive in our efforts to reform to introduce uh, reforms and changes in education because even before the results came out, we were already warning that we may not necessarily do well based on our national assessment tests because before we participated in PISA, we had national assessment tests, we did not perform well, and we were badly excoriated and we were told that the level of education is going down. But again, this is why we said that it is likely that we will not perform well in the PISA examinations. And we said this, this months before, during the budget hearings. And this is in preparation for um, uh, the kinds of reforms. And we have launched, and we really appreciate the support of uh, uh, the various committee chairs here in the Senate and Congress, as well as the cabinet, uh, which we call Educalidad, pivoting from access to quality before the PISA results. Right now, in the Department of Education, we are engaged in a conversation, and we are asking ourselves, will we participate in the next round of PISA examinations. And, and uh, I, uh, we will also be, Love Basilote is here. On February 18, we're going to consult our supporters, our, our friends from the legislature, and ask them, are we going to participate? Because this is the first time, and I'd like to repeat it again and again and again. This is the first time that we have participated in PISA, and therefore it's difficult to establish a benchmark. And we look at India, for example. Andreas knows this very well. India, the first time it participated, was second to the bottom of the list. Then. It did not participate for nine years. Next year, India is going to participate. So India will definitely affect the ranking system. This is my problem with ranking systems. Then you also have big countries with big educational systems. Egypt is not participating. There are still many countries which are not participating in PISA. There are those who participated and rested. As I said, um, India rested for three PISA examinations. It is participating next year. So perhaps we can get also advice from, uh, from the legislators and from the, the executive says go, go, go. We are debating in the um, in the Department of Education, we're split down. Well, I will not tell you the results of our survey of our management uh, group because we don't want to influence uh, uh, the other groups which we are uh, consulting. Whether we should participate uh, in next in the next round of PISA because we'll only have one year to reverse a system of education which was installed in 1940. This is as old as I am. And, and so uh, 
this, these are the um, uh, issues that concern us and which we have consistently brought to the attention of PISA itself in our, in our um, um, exchanges. Um, for example, as I was saying, NCR, the observation of PISA about the regional urban uh, differentials, uh, that is also reflected in the Philippines. Um, NCR schools perform better, et cetera. Uh, I mean, the best among our Philippine schools. But how do you explain Region 7, for example? We laugh when we say and speak. But how come they're doing very well? How come Region 6 stops in science? Higher than OECD. We smile at Mindanao. How come Region 11 is doing well? And this is where you, have, you get value from PISA results. Because we are now in the process of visiting and consulting with the schools who did well and perhaps observing those which probably need more uh, assistance. And uh, in our kite program, this is on the curriculum. So we are now engaged in curriculum review. We're engaged in the instructional um, aspects and very, very important, and I agree with Andreas, the role of the teachers is crucial. But the role of the parents and the environment, this is the, uh, the E in the, our KITE program, is, is equally um, important, as shown in the Baguio case. I was there personally, I talked to the teacher, the principal, and the students. And as to the role of culture, I, I mean, um, having many extracurricular activities. Baguio City High School is fantastic. The children dance original, original uh, dances. They sing, they have a beautiful a cappella choir of high school students, and the students know how to read. So uh, I think, and I agree, that it's not an issue of the other activities that students are engaged in. It's really the curriculum, the instructional materials, and very, very important, the role of the teachers, and then the role of the external environments, our supporters, our inspirers who say, go, 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 the legislature, the executive who, who provides us with the financial support, and so on, and tell us that, you know, and um, I'm very, very grateful. There has been very um, minimal finger pointing. But of course, you cannot avoid being called by name. I have been called out in some articles by name as responsible for the performance of PISA. As I said, of a system which has been existing and which is as old as I am. And the matter also of the debate of senior high school and junior high school, because the immediate knee-jerk reaction of some critics of education is that down with senior high school. The results of the PISA examination, and because we did our own assessment, and we have it here, um, we'll furnish the Senate a copy of our national report on the results of the PISA, clearly show that, of course, the senior high school students, 15-year-olds, performed better than junior high school students of the same age. So clearly, senior high school is an advantage. So curriculum, materials, teachers, most important of all, and the learning environment, these are the focus now of our pivot to, to, to quality. And this is where we are also utilizing and learning from the results of PISA. But I must say, Your Honor, uh, Senator Wynn, we still have not decided whether we will participate in next year's PISA, because that means one year of preparation. India rested for nine years, it's now participating. Peru was at the bottom of the list, and it has improved also its standing, and that to set up a, a, a program, really. But we also have to be very careful and mindful and this is the debate in education. Are we going to focus our reforms 
for ranking purposes. What they say is teaching for the tests, the way schools prepare for licensure examinations, where ranking is very, very important and can be, a, as I said, politicized. So uh, these are the issues that we are facing. I must say, Your Honor, we have not yet decided. We'll decide after love, the February 18 uh, meeting with our external supporters, uh, civil society, education experts. We will ask them. We already have asked our management uh, people more than 50 regional directors, supervisors, superintendents, principals. Are we going for uh, next, uh, the next round? And uh, we'll see, and we'll also seek uh, privately also your views and your opinions, whether we go for the next round or really focus on this. And if we introduce reforms, it will not necessarily be so that we will raise our rankings in PISA. It's because we care about the future of our learners, 27.2 million of them, and the future of this country. We should not fall into the trap of you know, all those very special programs in order to, to, to rank highly. Um, I like to cite, for example, one of our highest performing countries in Asia, Singapore. And the Minister of Education always warned us, his fellow ministers, do not look at us. We are only a city. Look at yourselves. And the purpose of education is not ranking, but ranking external assessment is useful because we see ourselves through the mirror of global standards. And we face the challenges that uh, confront education for the country, for the future, for our learners, and not to rank as number one necessarily. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Secretary. And again, welcome to the hearing. Um, we'll, um, let Andreas go. It's already, I think, 4 a.m. in uh, Paris, and we'll let you uh, go to sleep. But uh, thank you very much, Andreas, for sharing with us uh, your insights on the results of uh, PISA. And uh, we hope we can invite you uh, personally to come back here in the Philippines or to come here to the Philippines to uh, personally share with us uh, more of your analysis. And uh, this will also enable various stakeholders to uh, interact with you personally uh, in flesh so that we will have a much more robust discussion on uh, the system of education in the Philippines. But thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, and I look forward to further engaging with you in person in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, uh, Secretary, again, uh, thank you very much for your time. and. Um, in the opening statement, uh, Madam Secretary, we said that uh, I think everyone knows already the results of PISA, and uh, it was given to us late last year, and everyone had ample time to analyze, make their comments, and today we want to achieve, what we want to achieve is to look for solutions, you know, and to look for actionable solutions, and how the legislature, through allocating budget through other legislative reforms can help in the implementation of those solutions. But to, if you ask me whether what is my recommendation to take PISA or, uh, next year or not, I'll answer you after yes. the hearing. You know, I think I want, to hear, I want to hear everyone first and I'll let you uh, know my uh, own personal uh, uh, recommendation. Um, with that, uh, we'll also go, uh, we invited other stakeholders who have uh, uh, conducted different analysis. Uh, here with us um, uh, is the group from PIDS, uh, headed by Dr. Manasan and Dr. Orbeta. Uh, uh, Dr. Manasan from PIDS, uh, any comments regarding the uh, PISA results and also recommendations from uh, PIDS? Thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, 
I have a prepared statement actually based on the recent studies that we have. Uh, uh, when we examine closely our educational system, one would have some difficulty in finding anything wrong with the policy statements. If one reads our laws and our accompanying IRs and DFED and SEDS, department orders, the basic principles are there. What then is our problem? There may be several, but from my perspective, and with my exposure to the system, the most basic and important one is that we never really check what happens on the ground. The most that we do is monitor and publicize inputs, measures such as public teacher ratio, class sizes, public textbook ratio, public chairs ratio. Uh, we do have national achievement test scores, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not too sure that we made them public and make people react to them. And it's needed an international test like this that wake us up to this reality that some of us are actually know all along that we have a problem with our basic uh, education system. In the last few years, we have been when we went around interviewing students, parents, teachers, uh, focal persons, principals, and our in our research for senior high school and MTBLE, we learned that, of course, the inputs are not delivered on time as promised. Uh, what we, is more striking is that teachers find the K-12, particularly senior high school curriculum, to be too ambitious. That's the words. Uh, sorry? Too ambitious. Uh, and, and for the level of knowledge that the students have. The issue is amplified by the failure to deliver the promised learning materials in, in many cases. For the MTBLE, we find that the schools are implementing programs on their own way. They say that they lack guidance on how to implement the program instead of using the mother tongue as a medium of instruction for K-3. They teach MT, which essentially is a regional language, as another subject, uh, uh, which leads to a funny situation, like for example, for children in Bulacan, I would suppose this is true in Region 4, having an MT, which is in Tagalog, subject, and a similar mandated Filipino subject, so there are taught side by side. So even the uninitiated will find that uh, situation funny, two subjects being taught, because that's, that's the way they interpret the MTBLE. Uh, that's their implementation of the MTBLE. For those teachers who wants to follow the, the DepEd department order to teach MT as an MOI, finds it awkward uh, because it's difficult because they were not trained uh, how to teach the content in, in mother tongue in schools. We also found that the, at least less than 10% of the 15,000 schools who responded to our survey had actually the four requisites for impl impl implementing the MTBLE properly, which are dictionary, grammar, orthography, and the stories or the big books. Uh, you can er already imagine the quality of implementation of the MTBLE program. Another thing, being a focal person for senior high school or MTBLE are added responsibilities without accompanying enabling, like the loading on urban resources to do their jobs well. Teachers have virtually no on-the-ground guidelines because of lack of resources and lack of time for the so-called uh, focal person. Uh, teachers have no virtually on-the-ground guidance on issues implementing the senior high school and empty building. Uh, finally, all of this, we don't really, it's, it's more of an unlike ideas, we don't have really hard data that these things are happening on the ground. We only found this because we interviewed teachers. But systematic way of, of uh, we should, we need a functioning monitoring systems to tell us what happened on field. Focal persons are not supposed, are not supported by resources. How can we get data? Imani &E, uh, had to compete with the general MOE. Why don't we assign, if we are serious about monitoring what's happening on field, why don't we assign a, a, a line item for monitoring of these programs that are very important for our education system? In short, we had all the good intentions, but we never really invested in checking out if our good our intentions stated in laws and IRRs and department orders are translated well into practice or are producing the intended results. We are shocked when we perform poorly in the PISA, but for those who know our, our NAT scores, we already know that we have been not improving in mastery for, for all these years. Uh, if, uh, we never use that information to post our systems to do better. We can never diagnose correctly if we don't measure correctly and make the diagnosis public to everybody who knows and so that they can act accordingly. 
We need to be diligent in measuring outcomes, humble enough to accept results, and be resolute in finding solutions until the outcomes improve. We should never be happy with good, with good principles. We should see for ourselves if those principles actually generate the desired results. We always say that how come our graduates perform well in the international labor market? Perhaps so, but we never really realized that those are the select cohort of good students. Good students always, almost always are self-sufficient. They learn by themselves, they're never really hampered by lack of resources or ill-prepared teachers. They are inherently brilliant and lack, and lack of resources will never prevent them from shining in school or later in work. Teachers like them because they understand the material fast, requiring less enough for teachers. So teachers do teach to their level, leaving them everybody else behind, bewildered and confused, and nobody really cares to find out why. That is how we get to have our low average achievement test scores. Children are not made equal. We should uh, always remember that learning of all students is the goal of education. We should find ways to do this efficiently. I think there's no magic bullets. If there were, we already found them a long time ago. Principles are nice, but we should always check if those are achieving the desired results in, on the ground and given our context. So let me close with a nice and appropriate parody. Uh, which is actually circulating in the internet. It says, in God we trust, everybody else should bring data. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Beta. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Philippine Normal University, uh, headed by Dr. Alan Espinosa and Dr. Uh, Marilyn Balagtas. Um, any uh, comments? Po? And uh, uh, your opinion on how to um, uh, improve um, the performance of our students and, in effect, improve the results of our PISA. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Wynn, for the opportunity for us to be part of this forum. We just want to uh, inform the body of the current efforts of PNU to also help understand the reason why we performed law in PISA. And what uh, we are currently doing is mapping the assessment framework of PISA in seven areas, in the three major areas, uh, math, science, and reading, and the four innovative areas, global citizenship, uh, financial literacy, creative thinking, and collaborative problem solving, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the current K-12 uh, curriculum that we have, uh, particularly mapping the competencies with grade seven to 10 competencies. We are not yet done um, um, writing the report, but initi initi initially we found out that there are gaps in terms of content and the cognitive demand of PISA with what is um, emphasized by the K-12 curriculum. So I guess uh, the efforts of um, updating our curriculum uh, as suggested in the Sulong Edukalidad uh, program of DEPED is uh, right, uh, given the, the gaps that we found out in our analysis. We also believe um, that um, we need to strengthen the teacher education curriculum. We have to map as well the requirements of international large-scale assessment competencies tested, um, not only with the K-12 curriculum, but also with the the teacher education curriculum, if indeed the required competencies of, of students are also being uh, developed uh, among teachers who are supposed to be developing the same competencies among learners. So we will be doing that too after uh, analyzing the possible alignment of uh, these competencies of PISA and other ILSAs. We are not just actually looking at uh, PISA, we are also looking at the alignment of other international large-scale assessments like TEAMS because we also participated in TEAMS and CPLM uh, MAM. So we are uh, uh, hoping to be able to give um, the results of of our analysis in a formal report to DepEd, but for now those are um, what we saw um, are gaps no? uh, in, in terms of the requirements of uh, PISA and other ILSAs with the kind of curriculum that we have at present. Because we assume that if we participate and we continuously participate in ILSAs, then we have to ensure that the curriculum 
uh, captures the cognitive demands, particularly the cognitive demands of these uh, examinations. So we could start with that, uh, sir. Just two points, uh, Senator Wynn. Um, one, we have to emphasize when we look at the structure for education in all other countries. For example, we look at the country, usually we look at the high ranking countries, uh, es especially those in, in Asia. Um, in these countries, there's only one Ministry of Education. And, and the a situation where one institution regulates pre-service, the training, the admission of future teachers, while uh, another uh, institution uh, regulates uh, basic education and perhaps technical education, uh, probably uh, will, uh, uh, has to be um, examined very closely. Um, uh, for example, uh, in Singapore, and I mentioned this in many fora, which uh, is admired by many uh, educational authorities in Singapore, the Minister of Education is also the chair of the one and only training institution for teachers. Admission requirements for teachers are very strict and very tough. And, uh, and so the Ministry of Education has control over the pre-service curriculum, what the teachers are taught to teach. In the Philippine situation, the DepEd uh, looks at post, you know, by the time that they are already in the service, then we have what we call the, the uh, skills, uh, upskilling, uh, process where we uh, uh, bring up to date uh, the, uh, uh, the teachers on new ways of teaching and so on, or new knowledge and, and, and all that. So this is one consideration. Also just an item of information, Senator Wynn. Uh, in 2018 PISA, the focus was on reading. And this really caused us a great deal of alarm when we realized that we have learners who still cannot read. In the next PISA, which will be uh, in 2021, 2021 next year, the focus will be on mathematics. This is why we have to think very carefully. That long areas, yan, pero my, I know, my special attention, my naka highlight, 2018 reading, Sunod is mathematics. And again, interestingly, uh, uh, Region 6, Region 7, Occidental, Oriental, they do very well in mathematics. And so if, if we're serious about, uh, uh, we, we, we really have to be, uh, we are already setting up committees in, set in anticipation if such a decision will be made. We're already starting to work because we know that uh, mathematics will be uh, the next uh, area of uh, assessment uh, if we so uh, decide. And I confirm uh, the fact that um, PNU and uh, the Department of Education have been working very closely. Especially we're very interested in the kind of research that they do. And uh, we always invite them to the Teacher Education Council, which is chaired by the, by the department. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. So, uh, Dr. Balagtas, no, I know you're in the midst of, uh, of uh, doing your research, but can you share with us at least your initial finding? I'm very interested in learning the, the disconnect between the competencies being taught in higher education and also the competencies required under the K-12. No? Uh, you made mention earlier that it seems like in your preliminary studies there is this disconnect. No? So can you, can you elaborate on that further? Um, I have here uh, a report of the science group because we formed seven groups um, for uh, the, the seven areas that I mentioned. The three core 
areas, the science, scientific literacy, reading literacy, mathematics literacy, and we also include four innovative areas, ma'am, to include uh, creative thinking. But unfortunately, I have only here the draft report of the science group as we started only uh, two weeks ago, uh, Senator. So it says here, um, if I may read, um, for the science, there were found high degree of alignments in terms of the percentage allocation of the covered topics. So these are reflections of the content domains, content knowledge, procedural knowledge, and epistemic knowledge in the content standards of the K-12 curriculum and representations of scientific learning competencies and levels of cognitive demand. The identified gaps were just limited to a few topics which were not explicitly included. So when I say explicitly included here in, in the process of our uh, analysis, we look at the key um, topics in the defined competencies of PISA and that of the K-12. So it says here, limited uh, few topics were not explicitly uh, included in our K-12 uh, curriculum, but may be implicitly considered by a proficient and seasoned teacher, if not a discipline expert. Some other topics were found to be included but not substantially covered to provide a broader perspective to more complex unit topics. Overall, it can be surmised that the present K-12 science curriculum for grade 7 to 10 covers the expected elements specified in the PISA 2018 science framework. In incidental to the mapping done was the noted uneven distribution of the above-mentioned elements in conclusion number one, that is, content topics were not proportionately and appropriately spread across grade levels. The learning competencies were not proportionately and appropriately distributed in consideration of grade level and the cognitive demand level expected of the growing um, learners. So in their analysis, for example, uh, the physical systems are concentrated in higher grade levels but not distributed in lower levels. And then in terms of cognitive demand, more on explaining in the curriculum, but the PISA requires more of evaluating and interpreting uh, uh, data. In, so in layman, are... Doc, in layman, yung kailangan na competencies ng PISA hindi, match hindi tugma sa, sa tinuturo sa ng competency natin yes, in K-12. In, in, in layman yes, terms. Yes. No? And thinking that the curriculum is the Bible of all teachers, we really need uh, updating of this. If we want to, you know, especially if uh, we aim to participate again in, in, in PISA and in other ILSAs. In, in other words, because of that uh, misalignment, uh, naturally, we will not perform well yes, in PISA, yes. in short. Yes. No? Because well, the cognitive requirements are not in this Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and that's, uh, I think, the pattern in almost all reports. We have the gaps, but we have not written and, and, and made. Um, I'm also effective. interested whether the, you made mention earlier in our higher education institution those pre-service um, uh, institutions, are they teaching the right competencies to what mm. we need in yes. during the in-service? That is yet to be discovered, so Senator. Wala, we, we haven't started that but yet. But that's as part we, of your study. Yeah, no, but I we mentioned. are also heading to that direction of mapping also our own curriculum, teacher education curriculum with the cognitive demands of uh, PISA in particular because that's for 15-year-old learners and close closer somehow to teachers, uh, to students going into um, higher education. So in, that's our next direction. In, uh, in our Senator. last hearing in the 17th Congress, we invited a group of teachers. And uh, the comment there is, um, there is misalignment no, between the uh, uh, higher Target. learning teacher institutions, uh, those institutions that are training teachers, and those that are required by K-12. to Hindi yes, sila nagtutugma. Yes, that's no? true. Uh, in fact, the, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, adjustments were made quite recently lang. No? I think in 2017, 18. Yes, 2017. No? If it's done correctly, then we will see results of that alignment but only in 2022. Because yes, four years yes, young. Yes. Ano, no? Is that a right analysis? Is that a correct analysis based on your own uh, analysis? Yes, I think that's the, the uh, for me, that's the right direction of uh, examining whether uh, the 2017 CHED mandated um, curriculum for uh, teacher education programs 
would also capture the, the you know, the cognitive requirements of um, uh, international large-scale assessment. And that, you said, um, Senator, it was released for teacher education institutions to uh, implement only in 2017. And then we participated in 2018. So we did not really, I, I, to my, uh, well, I surmise that teachers of this uh, DepEd students were not also prepared. So is that correct to assess that, that our teachers are not prepared to teach K-12? Yes, to 12? I, I think so too. Uh, K well, to 12. in terms of the cognitive demand of the international large-scale assessment, because in, in our analysis, we are more on emphasizing low level instead of the high level. But in terms of content, I guess they know. But how to deepen this among the learners is, I think, um, necessary. My, my question, I just want to put this very simply, you know, so that people will understand. Are our teachers trained to teach the K to 12 as we speak? Yes, yes, They're uh, Senator, yes, Paul. Okay, are the competencies required under the K to 12 being taught right now? Yes, in higher yes, Paul. Uh, but so the, yes, uh, uh, Senator, I think the, uh, there was already an effort to align the K teacher education curriculum with the K to 12, but in terms of its alignment to external standards, I think that is yet to be um, uh, <laughs> yun ang, yun ang wala pa. unveiled. Yeah, okay. we don't know. Sir. If if that is the case, uh, I know for a fact that it's only 2017 yes. when Chad mandated that yes. alignment. Yes. So yung mga nagtuturo ngayon, kasi kung 2017, nag-aaral pa sila ngayon. Eh, no? Nag-aaral pa lang po. So yung yeah. mga nagtuturo ngayon, hindi pa sila naka-align. Yes, but... Yes, no? that's true. But the DepEd has its uh, training for teachers in preparation for the demands of K-12. to So that's where our teacher education institutions also contributed as, as they serve as trainers of DepEd. Those are, t the teachers were being trained while they are already in service. Yes, no? that's true. So if you link everything together, uh, what we are say, he hearing earlier, our teachers are already overworked. Yes. Yes. No? Doing a lot of administrative responsibilities. At yes. the same time, they should be reskilled to teach K right. to 12. No? They right. were not taught naturally. Yes. No? In fact, they, they have to be taught uh, in haste, no? mabilisan, yes. because of the requirements of the K to 12 implementation. No? That is what I am uh, getting from the records yes. and from my conversation with a lot of the experts. Yes, that's is true. that a correct analysis? Yes, that's true. Okay. So, uh, Although in the case of the Philippine Normal U University, we started implementing our K-12 compliant teacher education curriculum ahead of the 2017 uh, released uh, CMO of CHED. In other words, a, a, is it correct to say a right process will be, okay, we will do K-12, but we have to make sure that the higher te uh, the uh, uh, higher learning teacher institutions will align right away yes. so that the teachers after four years will be completely competent in the requirements of the K-12. Yes, yes. Correct? Hindi yung bigla anti-drain yes, na lang yes, sila. Yes. No? So it should start from the pre-service uh, education, pre-service okay. teachers education. Okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I agree with the, with the drift of the conversation. Uh, because the <coughs> the role of the teacher, of course, obviously is is, is crucial. Uh, DepEd comes in only during the in service aspect. That is where we have the National Educators Academy, where we have the upskilling and so on, and we are transforming uh, NAYAP. And we started this when we came in, looking at the curriculum the subjects, etc., cetera, uh, in our NAYAP uh, itself. But the pre-service is not within our uh, mandate, uh, uh, obviously. Um, for example, um, we, we always talk about matching needs and uh, availability of teachers. We're moving towards mathematics, science, and so on, literacy. Uh, we, we have engineers who, we are recruiting engineers to teach mathematics and, and, and uh, other um, uh, professions to teach chemistry. Uh, all they need to do, 
what they need to do is to pass the let because we need teachers in mathematics, for example, and we need to teach them in different ways, in new ways, different from what probably was taught in, in college, the usual lecture discussion, things it does not uh, hold anymore with youngsters who are who who can get all the data they want just in their in their cell phones. It's not so much learning data and information which sometimes change and are challenged, but it's really analyzing the data, making sense of of all the information that is fed to them from sources outside, for example, of of of, of the ed and this is where um, we are we are going and i quite agree that we really have to examine the pre service also the admission requirements for uh, for teacher for the pre service uh, um, activities but i would not like to comment because this is not within our our, our mandate but th that would be interesting uh, to look at uh, you think uh, dads also has some suggestions um, I yes, just wanted uh, to ask if uh, the Dr. Balagtas about the possibility of also finding out whether our PPST, you know, as identified as con launched by DepEd in 2016, also addresses the cognitive demands of the ILSAS. Yeah? Are the competencies we have identified for our teachers also somehow compliant with the uh, the requirements of ELSAS. Would that be part of your investigation? Uh, as I said, uh, Yusek, we've started mapping PIL, uh, ELSAS with K-12, to but we will move to uh, that same direction for teacher ed and eventually uh, P, uh, PPSD, PNU being one of the, the crafters of um, the said document. You said, and, uh, and, and Secretary, you know, I, it seems to me that uh, uh, our teachers are not prepared you know, um, with K-12 to because of that uh, very quick implementation of K-12. to you know? um, From what I am gathered from the experts and also from hearing on the ground, that the K-12 to was implemented uh, in a very fast manner. You know? Uh, meaning our teachers uh, had very little time to be trained and to learn competencies as required by K-12. Pero hindi na natin mababalik yung oras eh. No? We cannot go back in time and, and reverse all of this. What are we doing to address this right now? Because if we are saying that yung mga teachers gagraduate pa by 2022, ito yung mga teachers na naturuan ng K-12, but implementing K-12, no? What are we doing to uh, at least improve and align the competencies of our teachers to the requirements of K-12? to uh, As I said, Your Honor, uh, we are transforming our um, NAYAP, our National Educators Academy, in terms of the curriculum, the style of teaching, and, and the content. And we have been consulting also with uh, our uh, external supporters, uh, the legislature, as to how uh, this process can be envisioned. Um, also, um, we have the Teacher Education Council, which is headed by the uh, Secretary of Education, where the educational institutions are also contributing. And uh, we are going to convene this year because we are mandated by law to uh, convene and review all these uh, procedures. From day one, when we came in, the curriculum was really what uh, immediately attracted our attention, uh, especially the pre-service um, aspect. And um, so these are what, uh, these are the things that are going on. And uh, also interestingly, and we thank the Senate and the legislature for uh, approving our request as a next budgetary. We are creating what we call a futures study group. What is the future of education? What will education be like? What are we going to expect from our learners if we are moving to what Harare describes as hindi na homo sapiens but homo deus, longer lifespans for people, 150 years, uh, lifespans, 
uh, what are we preparing? We, we have to prepare our learners for multiple competencies, for not very specific, like um, my favorite example is accounting, because I'm an accounting major. Uh, much of accounting um, uses uh, IT already. These are automatically done. Uh, an accountant from another country can easily do the financial statements, review everything, make reports, etc., through computer. So it's not the taught the same way it was. The standards of admission. We have just uh, uh, finished a study by Semio Inotech. This is a, an Asian study, comparative Asian study, on what motivates Kasi importante talaga ang teacher, so I keep on studying the teacher since I'm also a teacher myself. What motivates a teacher to join the teaching profession? Why does one become a teacher? And I have recounted so many times, sitting down with teachers and asking them, why do you want to be, why are you in the teaching professions? And so good, kasi I was not a, one answered, hindi ako na-admit kasi sa engineering. Actually, gusto ko engineering o gusto ko nursing. Uh, hindi ako na-admit. So, doon na lang ako sa education. O mura yung tuition. O my family wants me to work immediately. Kunti lang yung mga requirements sa education. And perhaps we, we have to uh, look at the matter of motivation. What occupies the teacher's attention. Kasi yun ang sinabi kanina ni, ano, ni, ni Andreas na yung devotion, the spending of long hours. And we have teachers who do that. Uh, is the average teacher uh, doing that? Kasi titingnan natin ang, ang buo. So yung curriculum talaga, we are very serious about the curriculum review. And then the learning resources and materials. Um, for example, uh, the use of technology, uh, Senator. Um, I know one country na where there are uh, schools have been shut down, my suspensions, etc. But schools go on through uh, IT. So the teachers are still in touch with their students, even if they don't meet, they have face to face meeting. And I am told, uh, I was told only yesterday that one country is, is doing that. They are not suspending classes even as they are shutting down uh, a lot of uh, activities. Kasi, uh, at saka yung role ng artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence is is here uh, and, and now. Kaya the responsibility, the interest, the mandate for education is not limited to, to, to one uh, department uh, alone. It has, everyone is interested in, in, in education. Kaya um, yung kite namin, which is edukalidad, yung curriculum, the infrastructure, uh, the resources, the teachers particularly, and the, of course, the learning environment of parents, of civil society, of experts. Uh, one benefit that has resulted from the PISA results, um, Senator, is that uh, many educators uh, experts and so on are, are calling us up and, and giving us uh, advice and um, sending their analysis. And this is why we're calling a meeting on February 18. And we'll also consult them should we rest for a while. And like India, India re rested for 11 years and now they're raring to, to, to join uh, the 2021. Or like Peru, uh, really focused all their energies and their efforts for for three years to, to improve their, their, their standing after staying at the bottom. Uh, these are ma matters which we have to consult. Kasi dati yung decision namin was a decision of the department, I mean of, of the secretary and the, the officials. But this time, we want to ask everybody because we want to involve everybody. We want to get their commitment. We want to get their support. We want to get their advice. And Thank you. We're also joined uh, by the uh, uh, University of Philippines, headed by Dr. Therese Bustos, Dr. Nolasco, and Dr. Firedo. But before that, uh, Dr. Bustos, uh, Dr. Balagtas, you're raising your hands. 
Uh, I just thought of adding three more possible uh, reasons why we, we rank uh, at the bottom. First is on the format of the assessment. The PISA um, gives a, a test in, well, uh, multiple choice and constructed response. And our students are not used to that. Uh, aside from the cognitive demand, which is high, uh, the format could also be an issue. Because even in our national assessment, the students are just exposed to multiple choice. And that's not the only format PISA uh, has in its exam. The second is the medium of instruction. Again, the test is in English. And if they are asked to create ideas and they are not so confident in English, how could they express their ideas in that language? So that could be another. And the third is the modality of the assessment because it's computer-based. They are tested via a computer and the testing is adaptive for reading and non-adaptive in other areas. Our students, though they might be exposed to technology, but they are not exposed to testing on, uh, via computer. So their familiarity to the modality, the format, and the medium of assessment could be a reason for uh, the poor performance we had in the exam. Thank you. We'll go deeper into that later on. And I, in fact, I have some questions regarding the medium of instruction to DepEd. Um, Ms. Uh, Dr. Bustos? So I'd like to talk about teacher education and its focus or lack of focus on assessment itself. So even, so I'm not talking about K to 12 per se, but really how teachers use assessment, create assessment, and evaluate. So I would see problems um, like on a micro scale so this was pointed out by PIDS earlier where we do have problems with monitoring and evaluation. But that also happens within the classroom with the assessments that teachers create and how they use results can be very problematic. Andreas mentioned earlier that in, in, in many countries they would have professional learning communities. In our context, we would call them the learning action cells. But unfortunately, I don't think we're able to make full use of the lack sessions to address problems within the school, uh, problems that would have been identified because of assessment results. And so when there are, when you have communities like this, they can critique alignment of assessments in relation to targets and student performance. And I'm not very sure if we're able to use assessment results strategically. I'm not really sure also if our teachers, the ones who graduate from teacher education institutions, are ready to do that in the field. And so the lack sessions are very important and how we utilize that is very important. But in the studies that we have conducted so far, the LAC sessions have been used for just about all types of training needed by DepEd, and so it has not been used strategically as a tool. So if we are to use the LAC sessions to address the problem of PISA, then we would have to clear it up so that we can be more directed in terms of our use of the professional learning communities or LAC sessions that we have. We might really have to look into how teacher education institutions are training the teachers um, in assessment, really. Um, because what is not very clear, like from the Commission on Higher Education, the PSGs, the policy standards and guidelines that were released in 2017, all we have really are course descriptions of what is to be covered by the courses, assessment, in learning one and two. However, it doesn't cover PISA. It doesn't cover alignment. It doesn't cover many things that would help us uh, be able to use assessment correctly, appropriately. And so we might have to call the attention really of teacher education institutions also in this regard. Dr. Bustos, uh, you, you said earlier that you used the LAC sessions, the learning action cells, to address some of the um, issues in PISA. Can you give us concrete examples? Oh, they have not been used yet, as far as I know. We have not done any research yet. But um, 
I was part of a study that looked into uh, the early language and literacy numeracy program, which used the LAC sessions to train teachers. However, and so it was like a 28 lesson module, and some schools would take so much time completing the module, some short, and we found out that there were other um, topics that were being covered, that's why they couldn't cover ELLN uh, in a very short period of time. For example, there was some ICT training also for which the LAC sessions were used. And then if there were activities within the school that needed addressing, it was also tackled in the LAC session. So there were just too many things that were going on. And the LAC session was seen to be the time to address those things. So um, I, I think, for example, if we were to focus on the PISA, we would have to really set aside a lot of time, thinking time, for teachers to reflect on the results of the PISA and how instruction can be, um, can be changed so that more or less we're able to target, let's say, the cognitive demands of the PISA, et cetera. But that requires a lot of collaboration which also, by the way, I think is not really tackled much in teacher education institutions. Yes, we know that we have to collaborate, but collaboration takes a lot of time. So even in terms of the learning experiences within universities, maybe the learning experience may not be collaborative too. And so when teachers who, when student teachers graduate from universities and when they join the workforce, they may not have really the competencies to be collaborating. So, so union eh. So that's why we need, yeah, we need to really revisit teacher education um, in this regard. Thank you, thank you, um, Dr. Bustos. We are also joined by Ateneo de Manila, headed by Ms. Concepcion, Mr. Uh, Ryan Bruce, Mr. Ms. Maria Teresa Lindsay and Ms. Uh, Di Coco. Any one of you want to uh, speak for the group? Good morning. So we are here representing Father Nebres of the Society of Jesus and Dr. Arashon. And from the earlier discussions, we would like to comment on two areas. First, the, the PISA and the other things that we can possibly do to address the the need for better quality of education. In terms of PISA, when we learned about this particular meeting wherein we will be preparing for uh, the PISA in 2021, we were quite surprised that we will think of solutions on how to better uh, perform in, in a year's time. S and we, I believe that it's very short since we are looking at a system of education. Uh, Second, in relation to PISA, uh, there might be no problem in subject subjecting ourselves to, to rankings, country rankings, but probably uh, as we decide on which standardized test to use, we can check on the focus of that particular test. Will the PISA really test what we teach in the classroom? Uh, so we need to check that in relation to the curriculum that we offer to our students. Since upon looking at some of the items in PISA, as, and as mentioned earlier, this particular test focuses on the use and application, while our curriculum focuses on content, subject matter content. That's why it's really challenging for our students to answer assessments that they are not used to. In the event that we will decide to, to participate in PISA 2021, uh, as discussed with Father Nebres, he wants to, he suggests that we, we, we look at PISA, we look at the items, and allow the teachers and the administrators and those who will make decisions regarding this to take the items themselves so that we can clearly see what has to be done in the curriculum mm -hmm. and allow the teachers, those who implement the curriculum in the classroom, to include this in what they do every day in the, 
in the classroom. Now for the other possible solutions to our situ situation in terms of basic education, we agree on the value of the professional learning communities. In fact, probably in the past decade, most of the, the conferences on education would talk about uh, professional learning communities and how powerful a tool this is in, in enhancing the skills of teachers. Since this will be an opportunity for teachers to talk about uh, issues in the classroom, thus allowing them to work on action research or probably lesson study as possible ways of solving uh, small but real uh, concerns in their classroom or in their particular school. And in terms of helping our students, uh, Father Nebres also emphasized the importance of uh, the thinking ability. Uh, more than focusing on content, uh, we believe that teaching our students to think will be a crucial key to improve education. And how will this be possible? As mentioned earlier, uh, giving them the actual opportunity to solve problems uh, is necessary over just giving them the content, mm -hmm. teachers providing the content to the students. That's why giving uh, performance tasks mm -hmm. through probably project-based learning can be a good tool to provide students an opportunity to think of solutions to real problems. Also, homework might also be a key factor in providing that opportunity for students to have indiv individual learning time. Mm -hmm. We have a negative notion of homework as time consuming, but probably we can look at it as an opportunity to encourage the students to think, even beyond the classroom. So yes, teachers will provide instruction in the classroom, but guiding them is not, won't just happen in the classroom, but hopefully through homework, not necessarily written homework, probably things that they can think about, will be an important opportunity to enhance the learning of of the students. Now going back to the professional learning communities and other teacher uh, training opportunities, uh, I think we've been, we've been trying these uh, different uh, strategies over the years. However, maybe we can give more support to our teachers by providing them time. I think that's the main uh, problem for teachers, uh, not just in public schools, but even in private schools, their load might be too much for them to consider these professional uh, activities. Mm -hmm. And I think the support that we will give them, not just financially, but probably the, the loading will also, mm -hmm. will also require uh, financial considerations. But that will be a crucial, crucial step in enhancing the skills of the teachers and eventually improving the quality of experience of the students in the classroom. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, um, Miss Love Basiliote. Yes. Of, Good morning, uh, PBSP. PBED Good, pala. PBED. Good morning. Um, I'd like to frame my my remarks. Um, First, to congratulate the DepEd, the government, for participating in the PISA. Even though I will preempt the Feb 18 meeting, ma'am, uh, I will say our position on our participation on, in the next PISA, which uh, we fully support. We hope we participate in 2021. Um, and then um, in response to the senator's 
agenda for this morning's meeting, we will also be presenting um, long-term like long policy suggestions and out-of-the-box uh, policy suggestions as to how we can improve our performance in, in hopefully the 2021 PISA. So, um, so I think uh, I'd like to echo um, Dr. Arbeta's comment earlier that data is very important. And so thinking about PISA and, and, and our participation in the longer term, it's kind of like going on a road trip. We want to know where we are and we want to have guideposts. Um, we want to, we, we know where we are, we know where we're going. Um, and as we are going to that particular direction, it would be important for us to know where we are. Are we go moving closer, farther? So I think con consistent um, participation in international learning assessments is important for us to know whether our uh, interventions are actually leading us to improved learning for our students. Um, I would like to also just say that participation should not be framed as merely like rankings and whether, you know, like beating ourselves up and saying, oh, we're really mahina. Um, just to echo Dr. Andreas's comments earlier, um, it's important for us to actually send the message to the public that this, uh, our ranking is not um, a forever thing. It's not fixed. We can do something about it. And if so, we are... Um, we are want, if we want to communicate to our students that you know they can do something to improve their 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 learning outcomes, I think we should also practice that ourselves as policymakers and as you know actual leaders in, in the education sector. That if we put in enough effort, we will see improvements, and it's important for us to see that as we continue to participate, we can actually track our progress. And and I really believe that we will we will see some improvements, especially as more countries who are not maybe as uh, as good as us will participate and at least in the rankings we won't be last <laughs> anymore uh, um, I, i'd like to also point out that really and i think the secretary spoke to this earlier that quality of education is not just a depth ed thing and that's why it's so important that this sulong edukalidad actually becomes multi-sectoral um, other than the other than the the test and you know like how it's in English and standardized and we're not used to we're not used to taking the exams in through computers etc there are other underlying issues uh, when it comes to learning outcomes in general number one is nutrition when when our children are not are going to school not ready to learn uh, they're malnourished tanted it no matter how you know amazing your teachers are there's just not the, it, there are just many things that aren't there and so um, you know how do we connect therefore nutrition policy with education policy so that you know our kids are ready to learn and in their classrooms ready to engage with their with their classmates with their with their teachers um, on the whole notion of teacher quality and I'm glad that secretary Briones mentioned this in PBED we've been advocating for an alignment of pre-service and in-service teacher training um, many of our TEIs uh, have a below national um, targets for the national um, uh, no li licensure exam for teachers or the BLEP. Um, our national passing rate is even very low. Um, in the in the we've been tracking our performance um, in the in the past twelve years. The the, the national passing rate is thirty percent or less, even especially in in um, elementary education. So it's a bit. It's a bit unfair to 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 burden the deaf ed on upskilling their teachers. You know, when they the, the quality when they enter the, the the education system is is already something that the gap is quite y huge. Uh, and so, having for for example, at least on our on our recommendation for the longer term, um, having that alignment, strengthening maybe the teacher education council, so that which is headed by which is headed by Secretary Briones, so that really the standards of our teachers, so expectations of deaf ed of their teachers, will really be aligned with how we license our teachers. So it's uh, it should be aligned with the licensure exam. And also the curriculum of, of te teacher education institutions should, should really be aligned. One thing that we, we are pushing for in, in PBED is really the barriers to entry to teacher education should be raised. Um, I don't, we don't understand why um, pag magaling ka, mag doctor ka anak, mag lawyer ka. But uh, if, you, if, you, if you're mahina in math, go to teacher ed. 
it's you know it are, are especially now with free tuition in in SUCs teacher education programs are are really now um, bombarded with, and especially because uh, salaries have also been increased so many want to become a teacher you know so um, we, we think that really only the best and brightest should be should be teaching um, we're at the in the longer term also and in in relation to sulong educalidad we're pushing for an interagency learning task force um, that includes many the, the legislator the executive uh, i understand that the senate has filed a resolution on the on the ed, ed, edcom like a revival of the edcom something that we we consider in just in terms of reviewing um the overall education system because as i said this isn't just a dep ed thing it it's really a whole of system um problem um, uh, just to reinforce the the importance of data we think that the la national achievement test that um, should be should be given by a third party assessment improved so that uh, there's alignment between our curriculum and how we assess our, our learners and how that's actually also aligned with global standards the PISA isn't just about rankings um, in in the 2018 PISA that where the results of which were released in 2019 it actually tested for our 15-year-olds' readiness to participate in the global economy. So it's not just about, you know, like level of intelligence. That's not it. It's really, are they, will they be able to function and thrive and be productive in the 21st century economy? And that's more, I think, that, that should be guiding uh, our thinking in terms of of the of our programs and policies but um, I, I agree that we, we have very good policies it's really more on the on the implementation that we need to work together uh, very closely um, and really build these um, collaborative and 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 uh, autonomous um, learning environments for our learners so those are the longer term um, policy recommendations a learning task force um, emphasis on data um, but in terms of the out of the box thinking and I just would like to uh, answer that particular question because uh, I think it's, it's important to also try other new things hopefully when we participate in the 2021 PISA uh, I, I and I, I mentioned this to Secretary Briones actually um, reading is very important uh, and so if we can actually do a massive reading campaign within one year because if you can read you can do math if you can read you can do science if we can do like a massive remediation um, reading campaign for our junior high school students uh, sorry this is kind of like rigging the test you know but we know who will take the test in 20 in next year it's the 15 year olds so if we do a massive reading campaign for our junior high school students, um, hopefully they will do better in the, in, in the PISA. Um, it was briefly mentioned by Andreas, but um, I think he didn't elaborate. But actually, India has been doing this um, tracking or streaming of their students. So those who, are, who need more support are actually um, grouped together so that teachers are able to teach at their level. So um, weak readers or poor readers are grouped together, given remediation so that they're able to catch up. So something that we might want to think about as we hopefully design this reading intervention. Um, again, nutrition, massive uh, zero to five um, reading. Uh, and then in terms of, of, of teacher quality, uh, we think that there should be a strengthened TEC. Um, we're hoping that the DepEd actually has a permanent seat in the board of teachers in the PRC uh, because really how we certify our our teachers needs to be informed by the biggest employer of teachers which is DepEd so so those are the out of the box shorter term but but again I'd like to emphasize that um, we commend the DepEd's um, pivot to quality quality is very important uh, actually I on behalf of them and and the civil society we, we encourage more people to join DepEd in their Sulong Educalidad uh, initiative we we think that that's very important and lastly and I'd like to emphasize hopefully we participate in the next PISA thank you thank you thank you love um, uh, secretary you sec I want to uh, go into um, the Sulung Educalidad program in which there are four broad aspects of this program uh, this pivot number one is curriculum review number two is improving learning environments 
Number three is teachers upscaling, upscaling and reskilling. And then number four is engagement of stakeholders. These are broad concepts, no? Secretary Yusek. Do we have, uh, uh, is there a, uh, uh, it, 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 have we operationalized this program already? And do we have uh, the necessary budget, uh, the necessary infrastructure to operationalize these four concepts? Because these are very broad concepts. No? And I, I, I take note also that uh, these programs were in response to um, the quality issues of our uh, system. But these programs were also uh, formulated towards the end of last year, no? Meaning, okay, meaning have we incorporated that in the 2020 budget, no? So my first question is how to operationalize this, no? Because the next is, the challenge here is how to cascade it down. And then second, do we have the budget to do it? Answer to your question, these are uh, very important uh, question. We, we can talk about possible policy responses, but these policies have to be translated into programs and into activities. Um, actually, when we uh, presented our uh, budget proposal uh, the last time, we already had, uh, we were already stating that we were pivoting towards quality because we saw that uh, there was really a need for uh, action uh, on this. And uh, last year, um, early last year, soon after, uh, you know, the legislature showed uh, support and the executive, uh, we created a task force already. And we have had several conferences. I have been talking to teachers, uh, our management group, our executive uh, uh, committee uh, on the implementation. So we have a structure in, in, in our presentation, uh, uh, Your Honor, uh, we will, which we will share with you. Uh, we already have already this uh, review and update of the curriculum, and um, we are uh, listening very carefully to feedback from friends. Uh, Father Ben and Nebres, for example, was one of the very the earliest callers <laughs> when the PISA results uh, came out, uh, and, and we like his uh, we like his um, advice, no. Hindi kami, we didn't approach him. He was the one who, who got in touch with us and he gave very valuable insights, especially since he's also in the field of, uh, he is in the field of mathematics. So we have set up the structure already. We have created a futures thinking uh, group because we should not be planning um, education for the next three years as we do in the legislature, but, uh, uh, as we do in, in governance, but uh, also what education will really be like and what it will uh, require uh, in the uh, near or maybe even the far future. Kaya uh, kasama sa proposal namin yung futures thinking group is supported by both Congress and also by, by the Senate which will allow us to um, uh, have um, more uh, in-depth studies, conversations, consultations with the different uh, stakeholders in education. So, yun ang ginagawa namin. And I'm going around uh, the country also based on the data that we are getting from the uh, PISA uh, results, uh, visiting schools. And uh, sabi ko, it's not only qu talking to the superintendents, the supervisors, and the principals. Kailangan makausap ang teachers mismo. Uh -oh. So uh, this is what uh, we are doing. We're going into full gear. Uh, I said a while ago, Senator, that we have not decided whether to participate uh, uh, or not. But um <coughs> in the meantime, kasi hindi naman is, PISA is a factor, but our, re our goal is really uh, education for the country. So we have been... Uh, in doing all these activities and we are very uh, gratified with the level of support, uh, criticism, advice, and, and positive uh, suggestions which uh, we can um, undertake. And uh, we are aware of the, the time constraints, uh, Senator, really the time pressure, 
uh, what I keep on telling my people in our endless conferences as I go around the various schools and regions, uh, theoretically we have three years left, but actually it will only be two years because uh, by the last year of uh, our service in, uh, in government in this administration, we, it will it will be difficult to get already the attention of many of our decision makers. So two years long talaga, and so the pressure is really is really uh, there. And um, yun ginagawa namin, and we don't hesitate. First time ito na talagang accelerated involvement of uh, of the. Uh, external community, those interested in education. We have education summit every year, but this time it's really much more focused kasi na, naka-focus na talaga sa, sa kite, no? Um, so, ayun, whether or not, <laughs> kasi I, I, I want to hear what later on what your advice would be, but uh, whether or not we decide to, um, to participate, uh, we will still continue with the reforms, whether or not we decide to participate. It took India 11 years to say that they will, to say that they will, that they will uh, return. Now on the LAC, but the learning action cell, yeah. actually they're already existing, and I quite agree with Dean Bostos. It's, it's the way it is implemented. Uh, like also the school management system, the way it is uh, implemented and interpreted at the ground, you know, you see you see a particular approach, so you add on everything else that uh, you feel concerned about also if you're the head of the school, uh, plus all the other um, uh, things. Um, we commit ourselves to, to really uh, having a stronger teacher education council. Uh -oh where we, uh, this is where we talk about our, our various uh, various uh, concerns. So, uh, ayun ang nangyayari, as I said, PISA or not. And also, uh, siguro bored to death na kaya because I keep on talking about it. When I go around and talk to the teachers, Senator, I remind them of the story that they always tell their children. And all of us know that, the story of the, the rabbit and the turtle. You have this rabbit who believes na siya ang pinakasikat, siya ang pinakamabilis na lumakad, siya ang pinakabright, lahat-lahat talo niya. And so, at saka yung turtle talagang ang bagal-bagal, uh, antukin yung mukha. And nung nagkaroon ng contest, in-invite na, na may announcement, there will be a great animal race. Sabi ni, sabi ni Rabbit, eh, ba't ako sasali niyan? I'm already the fastest. At saka, sus, kalaban ko lang yung mga turtle-turtle dyan. Eh, ang bagal-bagal naman nila. But finally, Rabbit decided to join the contest. So, unang takbo niya, eh, ang, ang bilis. Ang, ang bilis niyang takbo. Like me, when I was a child, I always believed that we are the best. My generation always believed that we are the best in education. We speak the best English. We pronounce English the way Americans do it, and so on. Pinaka sikat tayo, and we laugh at the other countries. Anyway, so nung nagumpisa na yung race, kita niya ba? Malayong malayo yung mga turtles doon. Di sabi niya panalo naman ako. Natulog mo na siya. So di natulog siya. Pagising niya. In the meantime, the turtles were flooding on. Sige-sige yung mga turtles. Pagising niya, nanalo na yung turtle. So, ngayon, ang aming uh, challenge sa DepEd, which I keep on reminding them, are we going to be rabbits or are we going to be turtles? Tapos yung debate naman, whether uh, we should participate or not, sabi naman ng iba naming officials and secretaries, chicken kayo kung ayaw ninyong sumali. <laughs> chicken kayo. So, sabi, so we are going, we are, uh, DepEd is now an animal farm <laughs> and people are classified uh, kung chicken ka ba or uh, the bull, the bull. Oh, yung bull or you are, uh, you are a rabbit or you are a turtle. But uh, well, yun, yun ang ano namin, uh, kantyawan but really after February 18 we will uh, We'll already make the final decision. I'm a Libran kasi eh. Mm. Uh oh. 
ma mahaba yung decision process. Tapos, um, on February 21, we are convening the Teacher Education Council. Oh, so we have to be much more uh, aggressive because we know we're running out of time already. And this has long been delayed. So expect invitations, expect courtesy calls on you, expect telephone calls. Tinawagan ko yan sila Sunday, one hour debate on on the excom <laughs> on a Sunday by telephone. And di bali na ako naman ang nagbayad. <laughs> if I see something in the newspaper, I track down all those writers na nag, uh, nagsasabi and I look at their backgrounds. Ano ba ito? Etc. So, um, that's where we are, uh, Senator, and we truly thank you for your support and your continuing interest. Ang budget is, is the law of economics. The resources, of course, are never enough. Secretary, among the four uh, items here, no, um, in my opinion, curriculum review seems to be the most practical. No? If you're looking at taking the exam uh, early part of next year, normally March, yeah, no? uh, if I understand it correct. So we approximately have 12 months no? from now, but 12, 13 months from now to uh, taking the exam again. And uh, common sense will dictate the software is the easiest or the fastest way to, to update and to reform. Uh, number one here is the curriculum review and update of K-12. to Can we get an idea on where we are now in the curriculum update and what are we updating no? and I would assume that the update slash reform will be in line to improve our outcomes including large-scale examinations like PISA no? so where we are uh, where are we right now when it comes to the update and when do we see on the ground implementation no? because again this should be implemented and cascaded down to all 60,000 schools no? in our country. So where, we, where are we right now, uh, Yusek? Good morning again, uh, Senator Wynn. As far as the initial findings from the K-12 curriculum review is concerned, in terms of the intended curriculum, um, our initial findings indicate that there's a need for greater clarity in the wording of competencies. Um, there's still congestion, too many competencies included missing or misordered prerequisites, focusing prematurely on higher level skills, exposing gaps in practice and performance of basic skills, and higher cognitive demand that, than what the age levels are ready for. In terms of the implemented curriculum, um, we have issues on the implementation of mother tongue as medium of instruction for early grades. Um, because of congestion, there is not enough time to teach competencies or deepen understanding. Of course, we also identified positive factors such as the school culture and professional development opportunities that have been provided um, as we implemented the K-12 program. But we also have uh, noted hindering factors identified by teachers as the curri curriculum itself the lack of teaching and learning materials, um, too much extracurricular activities reducing teaching time. There will be further present, uh, the, the complete results will be ready by March. Um, and the other thing that the Department of Education has done so that the Sulong Idukalidad would really be operationalized has been, we've done a series of workshops with the Exicom, the Mancom, aligning our WFPs, our work and financial plans to the priorities we have identified. We have also actually also identified the constraints and the facilitating factors on how we can do things better. The point raised by um, Ms. Love on reading as, um, you know, as a priority, the Department of Education has actually, uh, Mam Liling has signed a DepEd memo in in November of 2019, entitled Hamon Bawat Bata Bumabasa. We have really challenged the schools and communities to work together so that all efforts should be done so that every learner could be a proficient reader at the level where he is. Yusek, I understand that by March, you will have the results of your curriculum Intended. review. Correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, let me also add that uh, we intend to, um, by June, be very clear about 
initially what would be the priority competencies that we, we would um, focus on on the basis of considering also the framework of the PISA and other international large-scale assessments in terms of the cognitive uh, demands expected. We'll take that as a factor in coming up with the uh, identified competencies that we will pay more at attention on. But looking at the timetable, by March, lalabas yung resulta ng review. And then, when are you going to implement the reforms that you intend to implement? Um, when the school year opens. So June, um, ma June implement it. Do we have enough time to adjust the We, we are trying hard to uh, make this happen. And the directors have assured me this could be done. Okay, because uh, the review is one thing. Cascading it down is yeah. another issue, no? Because we're talking about a nationwide uh, approach. And my, my, my question, is leading towards if we are going to take the exam again next year by March, and you're saying that the review, the results of the review will happen uh, March palang, and then the implementation is June. Uh, we're now looking at a complete absorption of the students coming by June. Now, hopefully, by take niya, by next March ulit, eh, nag improve na siya. Uh, which I think is quite uh, astonishing if that will happen. Because, of course, the, the new curriculum, if we will, in fact, address the congestion, the clarity, and all that, will also take time for the students to absorb. You know? And, of course, the teachers will also need time to uh, absorb that new curriculum. So much so, the materials that, that accompany th those uh, uh, the new curriculum will also need to be updated and printed. No? Senator, it's not yet going to be the final version of the enhanced curriculum. What we'll hope to uh, be able to do this coming school year is a transition to the enhanced curriculum. It's really not easy to come up with the enhanced one. We'll have to again uh, engage as many people as we can, the experts from the different disciplines. There are issues on spiraling that we also have to settle. But, but, uh, the, the department admits that cu the curriculum needs to be updated yes, yes, and improved yes, yes, you know? yes, and reformed. Yes, you know? that's, it's, that's already a given. I think all the experts because also share the same uh, comment. No? We will also take a look at the assessed curriculum and the attained curriculum as well, because okay. there are four phases. But as, we, as I was saying, uh, while waiting for the enhanced curriculum to be finally put into shape, we okay. will be working on the transitional So when do we see the final enhanced curriculum? 2022. 2022. Okay. Yes. If I may join the, the conversation, in addition to the uh, to the um, enhancement and the assessment of the curriculum, um, as a as a manager, uh, as the dep as a dep ed executive, my my the way I look at it. So we are doing all this all the the kite activities. The way I look at it is I want which I hope ca if it can be done in a year's time, really to study the high-performing schools because they are already performing high. As I said, exceeding OECD uh, levels and even nearly matching Singapore scores. That's what Basic Science High School did. So uh, learning from them Aside from the workshop, workshop about kite and the singing, singing and the dancing, dancing, uh, uh, look at their strategies, uh, which we are, which we are uh, starting, and um, involve the teachers, uh, hindi lang yung superintendents, regional directors, but the teachers themselves, the the reading teachers, the math teachers, in sharing with. Uh, the other schools and the other regions uh, uh, there. And sabi ko nga yung recipe nila. There must be a recipe somewhere when you have 20 high-performing schools or when you have certain regions na whom you do not expect to, uh, whom you assume 
are behind uh, uh, other regions uh, doing uh, well. Kasi uh, ang national nating score na napakababa, it's, it's the national score. Pero you have this wide range of high performing as well as low performing. So in the meantime, while curriculum is doing its thing, uh, I will also be doing my thing. And, and really uh, uh, consulting, finding out, uh, watching, sitting in in the classrooms, and talking with the, with the uh, as I said, high performing. And they are not all in uh, NCR. You have in the Visayas, you have in Bicol, you have also in Mindanao. Oh. Now in spite of all the constraints which we have identified, all sorts of problems, they are performing well. So there must be something happening where they are and we want to learn from them. So you, you know, that's what my Exicom and my Mancom will be doing while they will be uh, struggling with the curriculum. Yes, Dr. Fried Frido. Uh, good morning, Senator. Uh, the Assessment Curriculum and Technology Research Center is deep into doing the curriculum review together with the Department of Education. Uh, for the information of everyone, it is to be conducted in five different work packages. First, the intended curriculum. Second, the review of the implemented curriculum. Third, the review of the assessed or tested curriculum. Fourth, the review of the attained curriculum. And then there's an additional one, a deeper review of the K-3 to curriculum. Now, we have completed with the Bureau of Curriculum Development of DepEd, the intended curriculum results and the report are available with them. Now, we are at the peak of the assessment of the implemented curriculum, and we are doing this in the four different quarters of the school year, first, second, third, and fourth quarter, because the learning competencies are divided into those quarters. Uh, so far, we have uh, preliminary data on two quarters. We're going on the third quarter. Um, a survey of teachers in focus group discussions regarding specific areas of the implemented curriculum in four regions, Region 1, NCR, Region 7, and Region 11. So we are doing this, of course the design was in collaboration with the Bureau of Learning uh, Delivery. And then just two weeks ago, we had a workshop with the Bureau of Education Assessment to work on the assess curriculum. So by March, if we look at the whole package of review until the intended, uh, I mean the attained curriculum, it is, uh, it is uh, practical to think that we can reach only sufficient research data for the implemented and uh, assessed or tested curriculum. Although, of course, th this does not mean that uh, initial reforms cannot be made, yeah. It's, it's, it would be an ongoing one, yes. Because um, it might interest the people here that what the OECD was saying, that our students did not perform in the uh, did not, did not, they did not creatively apply concepts or content in new situations, but you know the curriculum review for the intended curriculum uh, studied uh, and compared with countries like uh, the Common Core of U.S., Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore. Our competencies are focus more on uh, strong, uh, on analysis and making connections outside thought situations. If the intended curriculum is focused on that, but the performance of our students in PISA is not consistent with the intention. Because our curriculum has a lower emphasis on 
learning competencies that require students to perform procedures. So uh, then where is the gap? If the intention is for <laughs> analysis and making connections outside thought situations, but our students can reproduce subject matter in content, then there is a gap maybe in the in how it is implemented. W where is the gap, Doctor? Um, well, we are getting some preliminary data. It's because it's difficult to get two thousand. So, so what <laughs> in layman, what you're saying is our curriculum is uh, has a higher cognitive demand, meaning so it is attuned to the PISA requirement. In the in as intended. As intended. Yes, yes. So what you're saying is our curriculum has uh, cognitive requirements and competencies attuned to, to PISA. what PISA is testing. Yes, is assessing. yes. But the results are not yielding to what we want it to be. Yes. So it's in the execution. Yes. In other words. Yes. Okay. So that leads to... Uh, the teachers. I don't like to conclude. <laughs> We're still studying. You, you said in, 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 to put it simply, no, what are the top three reforms or updates that you are looking at in the curriculum? Just, to put, just initially, I know you're in, again in the mm -hmm. midst of doing all the research, but just to give us some idea, what are the top three uh, reforms that you want to uh, achieve in the curriculum review? We will try very hard, hopefully this school year, to be very attentive to the most foundational, most consequential competencies that every Foundation. learner should have. Uh, that's the, the first and foremost. Of course, this would uh, consequently um, somehow decongest the, the curriculum because when we insist that the foundational skills should be um, mastered, um, we'll have to somehow also open the doors to the emphasis on the functional, I mean, the functional competencies, the most, the most foundational competencies. Your Honor, this was also reflected in the results of the PISA. Ang, ang weaknesses in the foundational uh, skills which uh, should be uh, strengthened and given more attention to yung basic uh, foundation ng ating mga bata uh, medyo we have to strengthen it or think of ways and this is why I'm saying while well, they're trying to find the, the solutions and the strategies I want to find out what is already working so that this can be shared uh, with the others and more it, it will be likely, Your Honor, that what I find will be the same as theirs, only I, I get it, it in another way. During the PISA review, I can't uh, forget yung sinabi ni Dr. Andaya about the competencies. That's why I requested for uh, 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 official information on the competencies. Like, for example, uh, in grade... 10 uh, in English, there are 314 competencies. So if there are 200 school days, that's one more than one competency per day. You know? So dapat uh, computer yung bata para matuto siya. No? Uh, but uh, I think this is what, what you were saying, you said the, um, the decongestion of the curriculum. No? Um, we have been instructed, actually we requested that a technical working group be formed so that we can also um, study how the assessment is actually uh, done in the classroom. So um, we will make sure that the teachers will be capacitated to design assessments, formative and summative, that are compliant or similar to the ones used in international large-scale assessments. That's one of the things that we hope to be able to do as well uh, before June. Um, and of course, the corresponding training of teachers. 
and I also agree that the lock session has to be uh, made more focused on the the things that matter instead of a lot of other things. May mga biruan pa po kami. It could be relaxation or whatever. There are other names for relaxation in the schools. You know, I came from the schools, but we hope that the relaxation would really be a learning action cell or a venue for professional learning communities, creation of professional learning communities in the schools. Yung lack naging relaxation? But anyway, Susek, um, if, so by March, we will know the results of the curriculum r review. No? Tama po ba? Okay. So we will have uh, an idea now what to reform, correct? The idea po is we, while the, the whole curriculum review will take time because yeah. we have to reach until the attained curriculum, I feel that we should start addressing those that we already know should be addressed. So we will just... Uh, part of the correct. So we will engage you again this coming March no, to uh, know uh, what are the, I will call that, I guess, interim, no? an interim uh, or transitional uh, initiatives. No? We will engage you on that. I'll, I'll, I'll pursue the comment of uh, Dr. Uh, Ferido that there's a gap between the curriculum uh, competencies, the current curriculum competencies, and also the results of PISA. No? So th we're, we're talking about now e execution. No? And uh, in the comment earlier of uh, 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 Mr. Andreas, um, the teachers are also uh, given a lot of um, uh, administrative requirements. Uh, they're given a lot of things other than uh, spending time with students and parents. No? Um, can you give us, uh, is this part also of the reforms that you are doing to help um, increase the time of our teachers First of all, to teach, no? and then second, also to engage the parents and the teachers. No? And for me, this is part. This is also a, a part of the software, no? because by decongesting the time of the teachers, you actually give them more time to teach and deepen the uh, teaching to the students. And at the same time, you also give them time to learn who the students are, no? because right now, talagang mara I see a lot of reports from PIDS also came up with that reports that talagang uh, they're overburdened with many, many things no? other than teaching. No? Uh, have you looked at this angle also? No? If I will be the one to answer that uh, question, Your Honor, uh, this was one of the first things that, that we did since I am an public administration person and we focus on efficiency. So we have reduced very significantly the number of, of forms and reports that teachers have to uh, have to make kasi halos more than 90 at ayon ka mga forms which they have to accomplish. And if one is not necessarily ICT competent, yung mga ICT competents madali para sa kanila. But for those who, who who still need to upskill themselves, it's it's quite difficult. And then you also have problems of uh, um, IT connections and so on and so forth. So we have significantly reduced the number of forms. And we also have indicated to other agencies uh, to kindly limit uh, the assignments that they give to the department uh, for uh, specialized programs on their part. Uh, um, many other agencies normally look to the Department of Education, the teachers and the learners to, uh, to, to help them with uh, their own uh, objectives and their projects. So sabi namin, i-limit din yan. Kasi yung sa DepEd lang mismo talagang inano na namin yan. First year pa lang administration ko, reduce na namin yan significantly. Also, we have negotiated uh, and to a certain degree, with a certain degree of success, with the DBM on the creation of non-teaching positions. Kasi halimbawa yung handling ng, uh, ng, ng funds ng school, nasa account ng principal, 
the personal account and and so on so we want to to recruit uh, bookkeepers oh, hindi lang kasi if if you are teaching arithmetic therefore you can be a bookkeeper and and keep track of the school expenses and this results in uh, questions also of accountability kaya uh, yung non teaching uh, dinadagdagan namin uh, na mga positions pumayag naman ang DBM so that ma, ma reduce ang burden ng, t ng, uh, ng teachers natin. If I may just add, na approve na rin po sa XCOM actually the idea of allowing schools to also have teacher relievers. I think this is one area where the Senate can help us have funds. This one is not the typical budget for substitutes that are hired to replace teachers who are on maternity leave. The idea of teacher relievers is um, a school principal may call anyone in the pool of relievers who should facilitate learning for a teacher who's absent for a day because the teacher was requested to do something else or the teacher has filed a leave of absence at being sick or what. So I feel that, uh, yeah, to make sure that there is time on task and learning will continue even if a few teachers are requested to become coaches in the sports events, etc. Somebody is hired on a daily basis, for example, if the absence is just for a day. We have made the proposal and it was approved during our recent Exico meeting that we will propose the idea of having funds to pay teacher relievers. You said what you're saying, there are efforts now to uh, give more time to the teachers, not overburden them with uh, non-teaching um, assignments. No? And um, we actually allocated budget also to give them uh, relievers and also non-teaching staff. No? To, to, uh, all right. Um, next is, um, there's also, I read some reports, no? I think this is also from PADS, uh, about uh, incentives no? and how uh, teachers are incentivized by minimizing or eliminating dropouts. No? Uh, and uh, the adverse effect of that is there are non-readers or students who cannot read that are uh, promoted to the next grade. And of course, that cascades into a much bigger problem no, as they go up. No? Um, is, is there any, uh, did we change that concept? Uh, I do believe that we have to incentivize. No? That, uh, in, in, in incentivizing is very important. No? Uh, but I think it's the right type of incentive and the right measure that we incentivize. No? Um, any comment to that, uh, Secretary? S Senator, since I came in, uh, I'm not aware of such policy that has been abandoned how many administrations ago? Because, yeah, but the, the misconception is always there because in mga reactions, mga articles na lumalabas about PISA, sinasabi this policy of mass promotion, which we are not practicing at all. So uh, th this is why we are checking again on the ground practices, uh, uh, how, uh, how the policy is bakit anong basis ng mga mga uh, perceptions na you have, you you pass students automatically kasi wala naman we don't have that kind of policy at all we still have non readers no that uh, yes. uh, frustrated yes. and non readers uh, yes. moving moving up and this yes. contributes also to of course performance and outcome yes. no? how yes. do we address this and it, it love men mention of of um, e reading intervention programs, but meron pa rin nakakalusot eh, no? Mm -hmm. In other words, meron pa rin nakakalusot. How do we address this? Because this is also contributory to the PISA results. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, from, from where I am, uh, the reports and feedback from the public is very important. Kasi uh, as we all agreed, you can have a policy na Walang, uh, walang automatic 100% passing, but we, d we have to find out if this is really happening on the ground. And we encourage the public, the minute uh, I get feedback like that, we immediately uh, find out uh, the veracity of such report, lalo na kung directed sa akin, uh, whether uh, in text or, or in articles, uh, 
uh, personally attacking the leadership of DepEd for this policy of automatic passing, which does not exist at all. Oh, so, uh, pag mag-reports, and malaking role ng public, malaking role ng press, and we always appreciate feedback that is given to us because the specifics are there, and we immediately trace uh, the sources of such uh, practices which are presented as uh, as policies. By the way, Senator, while I'm at it, uh, we are not soliciting cash contributions to whatever calamity is happening uh, for our schools. No, we don't encourage. But uh, sometimes uh, people call us up and say they have deposited to this account because I call them up and ask for one million or two million for this or that for the Taal victims, for the storm victims, and so. And uh, we absolutely deny it. We have issued already several circulars, but people still uh, are, are, are um, given the impression that we solicit uh, cash donations, which, which we don't at all. We, we prefer material uh, donations, and these are all accounted for. Um, but that's beside the point. Itong sa automatic passing, wala kami policy na ganun eh. Also in connection, um, Secretary Yusek, with the, the time that we give the teachers, no? Um, I know for a fact that uh, we have reading coordinators all over the country, and they also tap the teachers no, to um, uh, give additional uh, support to non-readers and also frustrated readers. And uh, of course, they can, the teachers can only give additional support if they have additional time. No? Kung overburden na sila, hindi talaga nila natututukan yung estudyante. So it's, I, I really uh, support the effort to give the teachers more time to do other things other than teaching you know, because uh, the, the student needs support and uh, the only time that the teachers can give personalized support if they have uh, excess time to, to give them. Uh, some schools in Valenzuela practice that but I do admit that um, we, mga teachers rin natin and coordinators are really over, overburdened no? with, with other things. No? So magkadugtong ho yung time and also to uh, the additional support being given. No? Another, I want to go lang, Secretary, to the nuances of the PISA report. No? And this is in connection with the uh, learning environment, uh, letter I. Um, in the PISA report, no, there are, we have high incidence of um, bullying. Um, Sixty-five percent of our students reported uh, bullying a few times a month, no? um, uh, and this is, of course, this creates uh, an environment wherein uh, students uh, come into school in fear. Um, are we doing anything, uh, Secretary, to address this? Uh, and this is quite uh, uh, shocking to me, no, because uh, sixty-five percent is quite. Uh, quite significant no, in, in our schools. 65% of those who took the examinations. We have a already an existing protocol for bullying and the procedure, um, the instruction is directed to the teacher because the teacher sees what is happening. The teacher is closest to the learners. So, uh, we admonish the teachers to observe not only the learning capacities, but also the behavior of, of the learners themselves, so they can uh, intervene. So my process, kung mayroong uh, case ng bullying, uh, of course, teacher uh, can take action, and then it goes up, and uh, and then uh, it can reach the point where Lola or Lolo or Tita or Ninang or, or some high profile uh, personality uh, also intervenes, and so, uh, the response is fairly quick. Sa, kasi mayroon talagang naka-set up na, na procedure, may protocol, it, starting it, it, with the teacher. Saka, uh, in some schools, I don't know if, if it is all schools, pero I, I have visited schools na talagang, you have posters saying that uh, 
bullying is prohibited and so on. Makikita mo talaga yan kasi uh, even before I came in, mayroon na talagang anti-bullying policy. It was started by Senator Sane Angara noon. May law. Anti-bullying law? Yes. It spells law. out some mechanisms yes. to uh, report yes. bullying. Yes. But uh, in, in, in the PISA study, uh, in the Philippines, 65% of students uh, experience bullying a few times a month, where in OC, OECD countries, about 23%. No? So, it's really high for us. And uh, I'd like to urge the department to do some more uh, intensified anti-bullying programs uh, because this affects the environmental, the environment of learning and the conduciveness of learning in our schools. Um, this is quite uh, shocking to me. No? Um, I, I know for a fact that we are quite proactive, but I guess there's also a gap in terms of implementing uh, the anti-bullying mechanisms in our schools. No? Yes, because uh, the, the, the child, many children generally do not uh, tell their parents of their experience or even their teachers. And this is why we always admonish the teachers themselves to be uh, observant because they can see the, the, the relationships, the dynamics within the class itself more than uh, any other. Uh, but we also have the opposite phenomenon in the Philippines of teachers complaining of being bullied by by Lola or by uh, by uh, Lola or by Yaya or by uh, by somebody and so on and we also get uh, these kinds of complaints and have been this subject also of, of rallies that uh, we protect the children but uh, the teachers are also bullied but again this is uh, we look at each case and study the circumstances very, very carefully because we have a child protection policy which we are uh, quite sensitive to. And cases of harassment, my instruction, for example, to uh, in cases of harassment uh, of our learners, um, I, uh, my instruction to legal is that pag may kaso ng harassment, action kaagad, don't wait for the usual six months or one year before you know a, a, a decision is made. It's at ganong ganon talagang we consider it as a, an urgent. Ano, kasi while you are trying to prove whether it exists or not, then it is repeated because it takes time. So that's one of the things that I, I, I initiated sa, sa harassment issue, and not only of, of, of girls but also of, of, of boys, uh, increasing levels of harassment. Yeah, the Secretary, I just want to again urge the department to implement uh, intensified um, uh, anti-bullying uh, mechanisms in our schools no? because the prevalence is quite high. And then going into another topic that was mentioned earlier by Mr. Andres, yung growth mindset. No? This is quite interesting to me. Uh, in fact, the uh, growth mindset natin dito is 31% versus OECD's uh, 63%. No? So, meaning our students are resigned to the fact that uh, being intelligent, uh, being a high performer is in your genes, no? uh, which is uh, uh, contrary to uh, the thinking of OECD um, uh, children. Um, of course, this is, uh, for me, it's something new. This is uh, a, a new uh, discovery in the PISA. But uh, have you thought of this, of, of this um, phenomena, uh, Secretary, and how do we address this? In f it seems to me that uh, our children are nag surrender na sila at an early age. Eh, no? And uh, uh, f for me, parang, uh, they're already resigned to the fact that uh, uh, I cannot be in that l in that high achieving level already because I'm not born intelligent. My parents are not intelligent. My parents didn't go to school. Are we doing to to anything to change that mindset? Are we exerting any effort to change that mindset? I think the the challenge is not only to the deaf ed but to entire uh, society um, as well. Um, I disagree with Andreas when he says that culture has nothing to, to do with it. 
uh, we have certain attitudes and mores which still uh, linger, like bahala na, bahala na, uh, uh, it's the will of God. Uh, babawi na lang ako in the afterlife. Uh -oh. Blessed are the poor in spirit because they will, they will go to the kingdom of heaven and you are rich and you are powerful, you will not qualify to go to heaven. Uh, and and, and uh, itong mga attitudes na ito in our society itself um, influence the, the also the mindset of, of, a, of a child. And, and this is not only in the Philippines, but in many countries uh, which are developing or uh, still have to uh, uh, move forward and, and progress. Hindi, hindi, lang, hindi lang tayo. So, uh, also, um, this is one thing I want to study, uh, Senator. Uh, kasi in, 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 um, in Europe, they had a study on what causes the failure of a child. And uh, ang title ng study, uh, Teachers as Causes of Child Failure in School. Uh, opposite yun kasi uh, usually w teachers as, you know, we look at the teachers as the mentors, the leaders, uh, self-sacrificing, you know, but teachers uh, enhancing failure of the child. And this time, ang in-interview, ang pinag-aralan nila, yung mga children themselves. And uh, listening to the report, ako mismo feeling guilty ako in behalf of the Philippines because uh, you, you have schools where the, the professor, uh, mga so-called terrorists, they will say, if you cannot answer, then you go home and plant kamote. Uh -oh. Then, so the child goes home and plant kamote. Yeah, you will never amount to anything uh, at the rate that you are going. You'll just be a janitor all your life. So, uh, and I quite agree that uh, we have to uh, to look at this feeling guilty ako because I know it's a standard joke that if you have a uh, poor poor performing student, oh, sige na, go home and plant kamote. My father who was a teacher, my late father, uh, used to say, um, to one of uh, uh, one of his students na classmate ko na <coughs> sus na ko si Lola nagkikwento na naman uh, sinasabi na <coughs> antok na antok palagi hindi pumapasok and hindi makasagot and so my father would say you know early this morning at 6 o'clock uh, an angel came down from heaven announcing distributing bilao bilao of brains 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 where were you? Ang, ang, ang ano niya palagi. He was teaching general science. Where were you when God was distributing brains? Oh, and then, sabi naman ng bata, Sir, nag-ano ako ng kalabaw, pinaliguan ko, kaya ano, I had to bring the karabaw and, and bath the karabaw and so on. So, saan kayo when God was... And that's a favorite expression. Uh, famous personalities also say that of people whose mental capacities they despise uh, give so and so a brain and if you say that about a child well uh, the effect can be uh, transforming so that's a very interesting study I want to do that also in the Philippines and thank you for uh, bringing my attention to the bullying and and this so-called mindset na culture practices standards and teaching methods uh, also shape not only because we always credit when somebody is recognized first the, the recipient of the award says thank you god and then you thank your parents then you thank your favorite religious priest or pastor and then you thank your teacher in grade two or in grade three but this study looks at teachers us instrumental in the failure of students, which, which probably uh, uh, would yield very interesting results. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, we, also, we also invited some public school teachers, uh, Ms. Halili, Ms. Herrera, Ms. De La Cruz, Ms. Vergara. Um, 
Ang question ko naman, from mga narinig nyo kanina, um, tungkol sa, especially earlier, no, um, sinabi ni Mr. Andres that our school teachers need to have more time to spend with their parents, with the students on the personal on a personal basis. Uh, uh, the teachers should have more time outside of the classrooms no, to participate in the in the community. Well, what is your experience with in regards to time? No? Um, ano ba ang inyong um, na experience pagdating sa pagtuturo at sa oras ng pagtuturo at sa pag sa mga part, sa mga activities with students and parents? No? Mr. Rara, ikaw ang uh, spokesperson? Uh, no. Sige. Um, I, would, I want to share lang po, kasi as teacher inside the classroom, kasi na, nakiki, narinig po namin lahat yung sinabi nyo, and then we agree, kasi po, kuminsan, based from our experiences, talaga pong ang laki ng impact na uh, nagkakaroon po ng yung sobrang co-curricular activity, na kung saan, kuminsan, kasi kaming mga classroom teacher, gusto namin sa classroom, para talaga po, makaturo kami, kaso lang po, ang nagiging problema, yung overlapping of activities, like for example po, may mga seminars to be attended, napupull up, napupul out po kami, eh yung competencies namin, kailangan matapos, during the duration of time, so, meron kami budget of work na kailangan matapos. So, merong teacher na ipupull out, ipapadala one week. Paano kami pagbalik? Eh, hindi naman kami po pwedeng ako kailangan kong tapusin. So, kailangan kong sumabay pa rin. So, maraming nane-neglect na subject. Lalo na yung mga bata namin, eh, hindi naman yung... Kasi po, in Valenzuela, we have so many uh, sections. Merong nasa cream sections, merong nasa regular Paano po yung mga regular na bata? So, hindi namin naa-attain talaga po yung, yung kailangan nila. And also, parang ang dami namin ginagawa. Also, in, sa part ng lesson planning, for example, nagbigay kami ng assignment. So, dapat isa-isa namin yun ma-check. Pero dahil po sa time constraint, kulang sa oras, hindi na po namin siya na-check. At kung ma-check man namin, hindi kami makakatapos doon sa specific topic that we're going to discuss for that day. So, hindi po namin nakikita during formative test kung napuro ba namin o naintindihan ng mga bata. But, we are very lucky at isa pa pong problema sa amin, yung absenteeism ng mga bata and some parents are not very supportive with their children. So, we are very lucky kasi nagkaroon po kami ng programa sa Valenzuela na Nanay Teacher Program. Pero ngayon, na-enhance na rin po Included na po ang tatay. So, from oh, nanay, teacher, tatay, parenting program, family bonding, na kung saan ang ganda po nung effect sa amin. Kasi, yung hindi namin nakikilalang bata, and then denial on the part of the parent, bigla silang naging totoo. Noong nagkaroon kami ng family bonding. Yun po kasi, yun po, ang nakakatuwa lang, yung LGU sa amin is very support, supportive. Tsaka, Ang dami nilang programa, like yung kanina na problema namin sa pagpapabasa. Sabi nga namin, bakit kami nandito? Eh, we're not, we're not really the concern kasi po kami nasa, we are on the ground. Nasa, ano kami eh, elementary. Eh, ang kinikater po eh, yung mga bata, 15 years old, so hindi kami yon. But sa amin po kasi magmumula, di ba po? So, nakita namin na kailangan talaga Ang ganda rin po ng program ng ELAN, we're in early learning, uh, the early language and literacy. Kasi nagagawa po namin yon yung differentiated instruction na i-apply po namin. Na ngayon nakikita namin and also yung programa din po with the coordination of our local government. Meron po kaming tuwing summer, the summer reading camp, based from the result of Peel IRI. Feel iri na based from, from that, yung mga nakakuha ng frustration, kinukuha po instructional, kinukuha po namin yung list ng bata, and then during summer, meron kami program doon para mapabasa po. So, so supported po yun. Kaya parang nakaka-proud po na 
masasabi namin ang Valenzuela, parang wala namang kaming non-reader compared to Suguro lang. We are proud to say that. <laughs> Nakaka yun po yung may pagmamalaki namin and also madami pong programa na naka-align para sa amin. Yun po. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Uh, Herrera. Ang gusto namin maintindi, actually, ako gusto kong maintindihan is in a typical day, no? ano ba ang oras ng guro? No? Uh, eight hours kayong nasa school? No, sir. Um, we're... We only rendered day. six hours, six to twelve, teaching load, 360 minutes. Yun lang po yung aming teaching load. Kaso nga po, ang problema lang, nagkakaroon po ako talaga ng overlapping of activities. Halimbawa, we're not against naman the program of the DepEd. Kaya lang, yung sisingit si the warming, sisingit si yung mga sa feeding na parang nakakadagdag. Although, okay sa amin yun eh, nalalaman namin yung problema ng bata. Kaya lang, Yung ini-expect namin na talaga mapabasa ang bata, nagkukulang po kami talaga sa oras. Kasi po, maraming mga activities na sumasama na nakakasingit doon. But we're not against that activity kasi nakikita namin yung problema sa bata. Kaya lang, sana, yun lang po, ma maayos yung oras kasi sobrang kulang kami sa oras ng pagpapabasa. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And also, Dr. Lawrence uh, Madriaga. Of Philippine science. Any comments, oh, sir? Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, actually, I have the same question as Mame. Because uh, although we are a high school, we are technically not under Dep Ed because we are an attached agency of DOST. So I'm very sure that we did not participate in the PISA. But um, uh, um, uh, gusto ko lang I share yung yung PISA experience because I think we are uh, in a um, in a completely different setting as most of the, the high schools that we have in the country. Uh, uh, for one, um, yung mga estudyante kasi namin, these are the, the, the cream of the crop. We are a scholarship school. So, uh, yung input namin magagaling na to, to, to start with. Uh, uh, but just the same, we always want also to, to uh, measure ourselves against external uh, standards. Um, that's why, kung ako yung tatanungin, I would, I would tell the secretary uh, to go for it, ma'am. Uh, because for the simple reason that we always need to know where we stand. Let us just please go beyond the ranking. Hindi po yung ranking yung mahalaga. Eh. Ang mahalaga po dito yung kung ano yung detalye, saan natin, makikita natin kung nasan yung weakness natin. For us at the Philippine Science High School, even at the management level, uh, we want that. That's why we went ISO. We went for ISO certification. We have been certified since 2018. Uh, that is because we want our management system to be, um, you know, to be at par with international standards. That's one. That's that's for the level of management. Doon naman sa mga estudyante namin, we our students take the uh, scholastic aptitude test. Um, SAT. Uh, that's that's the I think yun yung ginagamit primarily for. Um, admission to international universities. And we're very proud. Uh, last year, uh, sa math, uh, for the main campus, because I only represent the main campus, we are a system of 16 campuses. I represent the main campus in Quezon City. Na, we are at 92nd percentile when it comes to math. Um, I'm not very good at the statistics, but I think that means that our students uh, are better than 92% of the rest. So we are at the top 8%, I, I think. O also, we use the UPCAT to, to measure ourselves also. So, sa amin, ang aming passing percentage sa UPCAT is in the high 90s. So last year, we are like 96% yata sa, sa main campus. Um, so, uh, in other words, we really want always, even if we believe that we are only already very good, medyo magyayabang lang kami ng konti, but we always want to measure ourselves always against, kasi we always look for something to improve on. Uh, when it comes to our teachers, um, we have, I don't know if DepEd can do this, but sa amin kasi we have a hard limit per section na 30 students lang. So, wala, pwedeng less than but not more than 30 per, per, per section. 
so that we can ensure yung kumbaga yung na natututukan talaga ng teacher yung mga estudyante plus our teachers are uh, a great majority of our teachers are not education majors these are specialists narinig ko si secretary kanina they are trying to to um, recruit engineers to teach math we already have that uh, ever since po marami mong engineers kami na teachers we have bs math teaching math of course we have uh, chemist chemist chemical engineers teaching chemistry. So, ganun po yung setup sa Philippine Science High School. I, I don't know if that can be done sa DepEd. Uh, may flip side lang po doon because, you know, we our teachers are not trained in pedagogy. But that is what we what we address. Uh, we have at least once a month uh, training uh, for our teachers, most of which are in pedagogy. So, and, uh, so again, ang sa akin, if we are going to uh, participate in these kinds of uh, um, assessments, let us go beyond the rankings. Rankings should not be the gauge. The gauge should be us looking at where we can improve always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Senator, I just want to share um, a practice uh, in relation to the growth mindset that you were asking because I know of a private testing company that has developed 21st century um, standardized assessment that adopts growth mindset. The, the assessment is a modified multiple choice. Imagine a question with five choices, A, B, C, D, but in letter E, they would uh, invite students to offer their own answer instead of just choosing one from A to D. And in the exam, in the results of this exam that they gave to more than 50 schools, uh, less than 25% of the students would opt for giving their own response to a problem. Uh, and more of them, um, more than 70% um, would go for just picking uh, an answer from the usual multiple choice. So it's, it's a modified multiple choice as it combines uh, picking uh, one correct answer from the first four choices and E would be a space for them to offer their own instead of just relying from the given choices. And I said this is adopting growth mindset theory because it acknowledges eff efforts instead of just you know the usual reliance on what is offered to us as a possible answer one is invited or encouraged to offer his or her own response from a problem given and so i thought if uh, it concurs with um, what was shared earlier from oecd that filipinos are not used to exerting effort you know, when they respond as we are used to just you know the usual multiple choice in almost all examinations that we are exposed to so uh, uh, that's something that is happening in the country too and i thought that could be a good practice that other schools could um, follow yes, thank you um, as mentioned earlier by Secretary Liling, it's really not just DepEd that has to address this, but I, I know for a fact that the way teachers respond to the answers of the learners during the class discussion also would somehow develop the, the so-called, would enhance the growth mindset. Because if the teacher would uh, not actually uh, praise the, the child for the effort um, the attention of the praise is on, like, you're bright, so you did well, then uh, growth mindset would not be nurtured. So I, I feel that uh, within DepEd, we can do something, but the efforts will have, would really have to be um, in harmony with the efforts of the other sectors as well. But yeah, the way uh, teaching, learning is facilitated could also... Um, enhance uh, or somehow strengthen this so-called growth mindset. Because even the bright learners who don't believe that effort works, they would withdraw from further efforts when they feel that the chance of failure is great. Uh, that's also according to research. So it's really very important that uh, the child is encouraged to try out uh, other ways of doing more effort instead of assigning whatever it is he or she has accomplished to the genes or the 
the factors that can no longer be improved. Yes, love. Uh, Mr. Senator, um, the, just on the bullying and growth mindset, actually, um, if we just, I just ha wa wasn't able to um, actually look at the question that was asked in the PISA to understand the, the, the data point on the bullying. But um, if I may suggest to the DepEd to look into the question, what was the question that was asked to, to actually gauge the level of bullying? Um, because I think by th um, with, with that um, insight, we can then devise a, a program to, or an intervention to address um, safe spaces, safe learning spaces in our, in our classrooms. Um, I think all of us have been students at one point, you know, and when you, when you for example, um, try to raise your hand and answer a question of the teacher, and if, you, if, you, if your answer is wrong, your classmates would laugh, right? Um, so to a certain extent, that's actually bullying. Right, because um, cause your, your effort was being belittled, but how a teacher reacts to, to that particular situation, right? Like, oh, the, the classmates laughing at, is something that I think should be looked into. Like, what are the instances of bullying? What are these things? And how can we maybe deploy the learning action cells so that even in those particular learning contexts, we encourage effort, we encourage learning um, this whole growth mindset thing. Another thing, and to Secretary's point on culture, um, actually, if you look at high-performing countries in the PISA, they are cultures that are Buddhist. Um, there's actually a confusion tenant on, you know, praising effort. If you, you reap what you sow, so you, you know, you, if you put in the effort, you will, uh, you will, um, uh, be reincarnated uh, <laughs> as a higher being. So uh, looking also into how um, maybe some of the cultural aspects of how these perfo high performing countries on the, on the Buddhism part um, could maybe also kind of inform the way we do our interventions. But I just would like to um, again highlight the importance of teachers and supporting them. Um, in our program in, in PBED, we have this scholarship program called Step Up. We have a 99% passing rate in the licensure exam. Um, when we have ourselves, our, our scholars have themselves ranked in the DepEd, there's an RQA uh, process, they are highly qualified, even though they are fresh graduates. What are the key, um, key features of our scholarship program? One, we only work or we only send our scholars in the best TEIs in the country. Uh, we work with those who, are, who do really well um, as well. Secondly, we have a mentoring program. Our teachers aren't just, you know, like cognitive software machines. They have psychosocial needs that need to be addressed. So I think even in the, in the, in the TEIs itself, there has to be a support system. Um, on the, um, finally as well, in terms of just the, the design of the, the program, um, it has to be aligned with DepEd standards because at the end of the day, um, they're the ones, you know, teaching and deploying these PPST. So um, to echo what Ma'am said in Valenzuela, I think teachers need time to teach, um, be given more time to really focus on instruction, given as an, an environment of support through the learning action cells, uh, and, and, and decongest some of their um, teaching load, or not teaching load, the non-teaching load, so that they can focus on the learning of their students. So yun lang po. Thank you, thank, thank you, love. And uh, I think from what I'm hearing right now, uh, although we have the general direction to improve quality, uh, we're just starting to implement the reforms, no? And uh, I think on top of the list is to review the curriculum. Uh, and as we speak, where it's being reviewed and come up with an interim enhancement program. While uh, the major reform is also being undertaken in partnership with the uh, UP. So in other words, uh, we just started um, doing uh, reforms to improve outcomes. Definitely, business as usual will not yield to a better PISA result. So I think it will take a miracle. Uh, uh, it will take a miracle if we don't do anything and expect a, a higher PISA result. That's virtually impossible. But from what I'm hearing, uh, in the four uh, broad aspects of the Sulong Edukalidad, um, 
the one that is now ongoing is the curricular reform and also the upskilling and the reskilling of teachers. All the, the upskilling and reskilling of teachers will take time, no? Because uh, as we decongest the time of the teachers, uh, we're also engaging them, no? And uh, retraining, upskilling, 900,000 plus teachers is no easy feat, no? That, that, that what will take a lot of, a lot of time. But in conjunction with that, we're improving the environment, the conducive environment for learning, and also engaging the stakeholders. So all these, all four pillars, all four broad aspects are ongoing concerns right now, right? What I need from DEPED is really an operationali operationalization plan, no? complete with timetable. Uh, this will be a guiding document USEC for us to know where we are, no? and at least to know also if we are now hitting our targets and hitting our timetable. I'm sure you will operationalize this, eh? and as we speak, you are ready. We just need to reduce it in, in some form of document so that stakeholders will be guided, no? and uh, stakeholders will be informed of this timetable and reform. So with that, I think the next question is, what is my opinion if we will <laughs> take the PISA next year? You know, for the record, and I told Secretary this, I was one of those in 2013 or 14 that lobbied to DepEd, wala pa si Secretary noon, to um, take the PISA examination. Adnan, actually, our researcher was the one who, who, uh, who uh, convinced me to convince DepEd uh, to take the PISA exam, precisely to have a baseline. No? Kasi wala tayong baseline for that matter. When I say baseline, of course we have the NAT. But it's also to have some form of international baseline. We don't live in an island. Eh. We live in a global international community. So we need to have some form of baseline. Now we have that baseline. The next is, what are we doing to improve that baseline? And from my uh, assessment right now, we have we just started implementing and executing the reforms. In fact, a lot of it is work in progress right now. So my opinion, and PISA is not a cheap endeavor, no? it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite expensive. In my opinion, we should forego taking it next year because I don't think we will have any radical impact from now on till March of next year. No? So we can save money we can use that money to continue to do research because research is important. No? We are, PISA has so many insights and it has to be used scientifically and strategically. Sabi nga kanina, ang ating mga, sabi nga ng nila Dr. Manasso, we have to use it strategically. So um, in my opinion, we just started doing the real work. No? Ngayon pa lang tayo nag -umpisa. So um, taking uh, the PISA next year without cascading the reforms, I don't think we will, we will expect uh, good results. No? And uh, sabi nga ni Secretary, I just found out uh, today that uh, uh, India actually uh, suspended taking the PISA for 11 years. Maybe precisely because nga, no, India is a huge country. No? And implementing reforms there will take many, many years. No? So I think the rationale there is let the reforms be digested and executed well, uh, all the way down to the last teacher, so that we will get uh, good results. No, or else, um, it not only sayang in money, but it will, it's also painful for us to see it eh, as a country. No, if you compare ourselves to the 90, 79 countries, painful for all of us. No, being being Filipinos to see that uh, we're at the, at the bottom of the list. No, but what is enlightening now? We know where we are, we're doing something, it's not business as usual, and um, uh, we acknowledge that we have a lot of work to do. You know? And um, as, a, as, a, as, as, as a closing secretary, I just want to ask, what do you need from the legislature? What do you need from the senators? You know? What legislative reforms do you need uh, in order to, um, to achieve higher outcomes? Kung wala naman, uh, legislative reforms, what do you need no, from, from us, the senators? One, of course, is the usual, uh, is the usual budget support. And I have mentioned that uh, it's a law in economics 
resources available are not necessarily sufficient for what you actually uh, need. Uh, for example, uh, uh, one of the characteristics of our educational system right now is that we have this phenomenon of the last mile schools. And by our latest inventory, 9,000 uh, last mile schools are still, uh, are s are still needing help. And uh, we asked for about for uh, uh, na big na a lot sa amin ng DBM is uh, 4.5 billion, which is not uh, which is not really really uh, sufficient. So may mga I believe that kung mapasama, mapasama sa sample itong last mile schools, they will certainly affect uh, the ranking because there are 9,000 of them, and the possibility always is that. Uh, is there that na mapasama sila so una. Second, we, we, we find these uh, sessions very uh, useful. It will be recalled that uh, when the law on senior high school education was passed, for example, there was a provision uh, before it will be finally, uh, kasi five years yung pag-prepare ng curriculum at that time, uh, it would be reviewed by Congress before the final implementation. That was not uh, um, uh, accomplished at all because nagkataon naman na election year na. So there was no uh, review from both houses of Congress. So th these kinds of dialogues are, are very useful and informative and uh, gives us the opportunity also to dialogue with uh, our external partners and have access to to new information as to how things are, 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 are being done. Kasi every five years ata ang review, no, sa, sa Congress. Uh -oh. But uh, you don't have to limit your, to, to wait for five years, especially in the light of, of the results of the, of the examinations. And uh, as I said, we, we are, we hope to be able to expand our futures thinking group because it's not only the Philippine educational system which is changing, but it, society itself is changing, humanity itself is changing, and education has to keep abreast. And we, 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 we think in terms of six-year terms or three-year terms, but we think we also have to think in terms of the, the longer uh, 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 future, uh, what we are preparing our learners for. So thank you for the support for the learners uh, for the Futures Thinking Policy Group, but I think it has to be expanded. Because uh, we're looking at the experiences of the various countries. There will be many consultations and studies which really have to be made. For, as I said, uh, what skills are going to be needed uh, 10 years or 12, 15 years from now, what kind? What form will certain professions uh, uh, shape? Uh, how will they shape up, and and all that? So, kailangan we go beyond the budget the budget cycle. Um, three years, the by usually we think three years of budget. So we have to go beyond that if we are going to prepare our learners to, to face uh, and compete uh, with the with the real uh, world, and and and. Um, the interest of the legislature is always uh, welcome, although, uh, and then, ang, ang may isang issue which probably is always uh, 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 bugging us, of course, interest is on the teacher, really. Kasi ang nagdi-deliver yung, 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 yung teacher. I keep on telling our teachers, I learned to read and write on banana leaves and bamboo sticks during the war years from my mother who was a teacher, wala namang computer na tuto ako magbasa and all that. Pe pero, uh, kasi, ang laki ng papel ng teacher, no? so, uh, we have to pay more attention to how we are going to harmonize and integrate the pre-service aspect. I always ask, what are we teaching our teachers? What are our teachers learning before they, they, they join us and qualify? And yung somebody said, Silab ata, yung sa examination for teachers, yung professional, ano, we, are not, we are not in the board, of course. Uh, we are not in the board according to law. Pero what does LEP look for when it tests 
the, uh, the, the usefulness or the capacity of a teacher to join the teaching profession. Uh, yung, yung mga ganon, there are many uh, hanging uh, issues. I rather like listening, I, I have not thought of it, but listening to the discussion, for example, on the, uh, the growth mindset, which can possibly uh, uh, also influence student performance. Kasi uh, many of you have, when you were in college or university, gusto mo mag magna cum laude ka, mag suma ka, o mag cum laude, o pumasa man lang. So you consult each other. Sino ba yung teacher na walang masyadong requirements? Um, uh, sino ba yung mga terror dyan? So you avoid the terror teacher, the teacher who demands so much of you. So mayroon ng built-in na uh, uh, perception na, na uh, um, you, you can get things the, 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 the easy way. Diba, when we were students, uh, I, I was very fortunate in that uh, students would fight to be in my classes. No? Pero yung, mayroon namang iba na kung malaman nila na ganyan ang subject mo, i-avoid nila ka kanila as much as possible. No? Yung lalo na yung ter so-called terror teachers and, and so on. So, yung, yung mindset for growth, bahala na talagang swerte ko yun. Yun ang uh, tadhana. Uh, anyway, babawi na lang ako pag ano na in, in the afterlife. At saka I grew up si in my education uh, educational process uh, thinking that, you know, um, it's not particularly nice to be rich and to have money and to be successful, but you not get to heaven because it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And as a child, I wanted to go to heaven. So <laughs> so, so why work hard to, to be prosperous materially uh, and be uh, disqualified from uh, from entering uh, the next uh, level. And there are many who, who, who think in that way, ganun lang talaga, anak. Bakit ganyan? Bakit mahirap tayo? Bakit, bakit hindi ko to alam? And then um, the changes. All of us have experienced, pag unang salpak nating magtrabaho, wala pala, you realize, wala pa tala tayong alam. And then tatanungin ang boss mo, Saan ka ba? Anong, ano, anong pinag-aralan mo? Eh, absent kasi ako noon eh. Oo. Kaya hindi ko yan alam. So we prepare our students for change and that has to be strategized. The acceptance of change. And uh, yeah, anyway, I, I, I can speak the whole day and that is not what this hearing is for. <laughs> Pero you ask what, what you need, what we need from you. One, of course, the, the resource support. Uh, which has to be understood. Because education has the biggest budget, so we think that's it. Actually, in relation to our needs, it is still uh, uh, wanting. Tapos yung senator, yung, hindi lang yung sa teachers, sa uh, education environment, but the learning resources. Uh, kasi uh, as you were saying, we can probably do things faster with technology. But not naman to the extent of having robots as teachers. Uh -oh. So um, with all the hand-holding from, from our partners and the legislatures and from our fellow academics, I, I, I believe that uh, maybe uh, we can move forward. And thank you for your opinion on <laughs> Two cents lang ho naman yung mura lang yun. Who is chicken <laughs> or who is the rabbit? <laughs> oh, two cents uh, opinion lang naman. Mura lang yun, Secretary. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Secretary. And any last words from the... Yes, the Dr. Um, Senator, Dr. I just want to share a practice uh, from Marina because Marina performs the same function as that of PRC. Every year, they would release the exam. They, they don't have, well, of course, they have this STCW. This is the standards for training and certification of watch keepers released because that is based 
uh, on an international uh, set of standards. And I hope PRC does the same so that we could see how well the test is designed and our teachers could also be informed on how they should, you know, prepare themselves for such a licensure exam. So, so Marina does that. So, Dr. Bractas, you mean after the examination? Yes, yeah, you release the result. Release. It is computer-based. It is uh, adaptive testing, I guess. And after the taking of the exam, the students would uh, be able to, uh, the seafarers, the applicants, because these are officers to um, different positions in uh, seafaring po, they release the content. So the, the applicants to the certification would be able to prepare themselves as they have um, a way to knowing what is to be tested, not only of the standards that are to be tested, the content, sample of the content is at least released. Of course, uh, every year they would have a new set as uh, they have this bank of more than 20,000 items. So the chance of seeing again the same items uh, released in the previous year would be slim as they have uh, a big uh, item bank. How is that connected to uh, Because uh, Love mentioned uh, assessment of teachers, I thought PRC could do something similar to what Marina does of making the test, a sample of the test public. Okay, and then you. for the public to, to analyze. Yes, analyze what the cognitive demand or whatever is being tested in licensing teachers. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any any last words po from the resource persons? Wala naman po. Again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for Secretary for your uh, honest uh, um, uh, opinion and honest uh, assessment of PISA and also uh, for transparency, to disclosing to us uh, the strategies and also the programs that we, uh, DepEd is undertaking in order to raise competencies and the performance of our students. Um, definitely, this is a work in progress. We just started, uh, from what I hear. Uh, this is a long drawn process, um, but the most important here, if we, we have already started the process. So with that, uh, we'll be suspending this hearing because this is an ongoing hearing. And uh, we will require from DepEd again to give us updates on the uh, educa Sulong Educalidad program, no? in which it will be broken down and shared to the committee. All right, thank you very much, Po. Uh, meeting is suspended.